Hello, welcome to Is This England, a show where we talk about old England games and ask just how England was this. Today, we're looking back at the 2002 World Cup quarterfinal between England and Brazil, a highly requested game amongst listeners. Can it live up to the memories? Welcome to the show. How are you doing, Nick? I'm very, very good, mate. Yourself? Yeah, not bad at all. Not bad at all. We're revisiting, um, as you mentioned there, a highly requested game amongst listeners. Why do you think that is? Um, I think maybe just because some of them may be our age or people we know, and I think it's it was a big kind of cultural game for, for people our age, I think. Yeah, it was, it was like a um, now it's time. We're playing with the big boys, a bit of a litmus test, and... Um, yeah, I think it's definitely an age thing and a nostalgia and looking back and thinking, oh, we played Brazil at a mm-hmm. World Cup. And and as well, for people, again, kind of our age, um, it's very it's a strange game to have watched because pretty much everyone would have been able to have watched it if they were in school, for example. Yeah. Because um, it would have been, well, you know, let the kids do it because else they're just going to be distracted or talking to other people or trying to find out the score. Like around this time of the 2002 World Cup, I remember people in my art, my art class when the Senegal France game was going on. Same, actually. Now you mention it. Now you mention it. Absolutely, I do. I was getting. I remember a lot of people going, "Oh, um, Senegal are leading," and then you know when all like the old rumors come along before you could actually check it on your phone. Oh, Senegal are two 0 up actually, and never happened. Yeah. So it was just either someone walking around lying, or like just for new news that they got. Don't underestimate school as a, a breeding ground of bullshit. <laughs> Very much so. I mean, everyone you know, everyone knows the biggest liar in the year at school. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start off with a time capsule then, yeah. I think, as, as per usual. We've got a hole in the ground that we dig in and fill in with classic albums, uh, movies, events, uh, usually albums and movies. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of our touchstone for, for these eras, isn't it? Yeah, so presumably we're filling it with CDs, not vinyls, just saving space. Or maybe even VHSs. VHSs. But they're a bit blockier, I guess, so... Mm. DVDs and CDs. <laughs> They're allowed. Mini yeah. discs, all them. <laughs> yeah, or just one big iPhone or iPod in there. <laughs> Definitely. Right. Uh, I'll go first. Okay. So the year is 2002. There's a lot of choice for the time capsule. There's some classic uh, songs, some classic albums, some classic movies. I'm going with a British classic, a modern classic, so to speak. Uh, original pirate material by the streets. Whoop, whoop. Yeah, that whoop. is... Well, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine you not putting that in there. I was looking through some of the things and was just like, yeah, perfect. Of course, this is in there. But to me, that feels, that doesn't, I guess when I was the age I was when this came out, that I got into that a bit later. Oh, yeah. It was a bit too old for me, really. No, same. I didn't get into it until I was 16, 17, maybe. But uh, it's got to go in there. One of the most uh, original, to, yeah. not oh. to, you know, Pardon the pun. See what you've done there. One of the, I didn't mean to actually. <laughs> One of the most original and unique uh, British albums. Definitely like something that is truly forward thinking and not just rehashing old stuff and giving it a new slant. Like maybe you could argue about the success of the decade before from the British bands like Oasis and what have you. But um, yeah, original pirate material. Lock down your aerial. And I think it still sounds like if you listen to it today, it still sounds something new and fresh, which yeah. I, which I, you probably couldn't say about a lot of other music that was coming out around the time. It was kind of the end of... Kind end of, of like, Oasis. And yeah, end of Oasis, the grungy stuff, the kind of the new metal before kind of the indie la- uh, land fodder just came in as well. Yeah, uh, in my mind, it would be Oasis, late 90s, then... Travis, Coldplay. Radiohead. All, all those. Well, Radiohead are timeless, aren't they? Yeah. They're, again, another forward-thinking uh, band, but um, I think that's a worthy addition to the to the time capsule. Nick, yeah. I'm going to ask you about yours. What what are you putting in? So I'm putting in um, Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, the film that came out this year, uh, highest grossing film of the year, and the middle um, the middle of Peter Jackson's Oscar winning trilogy of films. Yeah, I'm glad you've got those facts there because I I've never <laughs> seen this film. I don't know anything about this or any of the other towers. Or, or just or rings. Any, any of them or all that yeah no yeah. it's um for, for me it was i remember when it came out and my uncle used to take me to go to the cinema to watch each uh film as it came out right so, and i remember it was always you get to go out of school for it for the day or for the evening anyway we went to the cinema for it and i remember once we both went and we were wearing the exact same football top 
Well, are you happy to divulge or you want to keep that secret? No, no. Well, it was a, a, it was a blue Manchester United top. It was 2002, 2003, yeah, it would have been. Um, blue away kit, like a European kit. But we both had yeah. like a long sleeve version and sat down next to each other in the cinema. And then he took his jacket off and I was just like, are you kidding? Like, what do we look like? I don't want to get into anything sad or anything, but this film comes out in 2002 and it's called The Two Towers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's a bit of a... Well, it's not, you know, there's a, a couple of letters missing out of there for it to be really bad, but that is what the book is called, in fairness. And they were all, it's yeah. one of those um, trilogies where they were all filmed back to back and, and things like that. So, yeah, maybe it'd be a bit detached from that. But no, for me, that's exactly what 2002 was. It was kind of the World Cup, me really getting into football watching, you know, these Lord of the Rings films, which were fantastic for me too. Um, I guess the listeners might have an opinion, which I don't, on the uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy. Where does the two towers sit? Is is that why it's in there? Because it's the best of the three? Or? Um, I think that they're all slightly different and kind of change the story along. To me, that's probably my favourite because it's got one of the, it's in, an enormous kind of action set piece that runs through most of the middle of the film. Um, right to the end and it was really groundbreaking at the time i definitely had never seen something of that scale and i think probably lord of the rings gets a bit of a bad rap these days amongst people because you've had things like game of thrones that come out and it's a lot sexier and like more deaths and dragons and all this kind of stuff when you look back then it's something that's actually quite simple but like for the scale of films they had to do and the budget that went into it Peter Jackson kind of coming out and being the, the, the big person that everyone wanted to work with from then on. It's yeah, yeah. they're definitely where you've gone in the time capsule. So, um, like you, like you said about, um, I forget what we were talking about earlier, just before we were recording, but, um, the films are absolutely everywhere, weren't they? You couldn't move for them. Mm. And, and that's critical play, praise and um, commercial success as well. So you can't really argue with that. I think, I think with that as well, you had, um, you know, that, you know, the third film really is the one that won a lot of the Oscars because I think it was just the body of work deserved them, really. It's like when a best actor or actress wins an Oscar, usually it's for their film they should have won. Instead. Yeah, it's like, yeah. oh, this is, you know, you were good in this one. Let's give you one for this instead. I, I, I hate that. Yeah. I hate that. It's, it feels so... Um... I think, is it just because they're just so behind the times and they go, okay, we've, we've buggered up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I get why they do it. It's, it's just a shame because then you think of, well, maybe on a year where somebody's won one of those Oscars where it's like, um, yeah, sorry about not giving you one in the past. Maybe somebody was more deserving that year and, and they might never get another chance. Mm. But uh, I hope. Okay, so, okay, so the big one that's DiCaprio, isn't it? When he yeah. kind of won it for The Revenant, which oh, it's a film that you just couldn't understand anybody speaking in. Yeah, it was like, yeah. well, you've put yourself through the hardest thing there, so this is what you get now after your body of work. Yeah, it was great. I, he's probably still got another couple in him. Yeah, I'd I was say watching so. Watching Don't Look Up, and I thought I started to think about how much time he has left in his career and the great stuff that he can do with that time because as we all know acting is a profession where age doesn't really matter you just play different characters as you get older yeah um well that's enough for our mark commode film <laughs> podcast tribute <laughs> definitely um anything else on on the go of cultural touchstones from this era uh well i think to get everybody in the mood um you know on the day of the game today the number one in the uk was a little less conversation by elvis versus jxl yeah just goes hand in hand with the game and obviously the iconic nike advert as well for this world cup in the build-up elvis versus jxl uh ca- cage fighting Cage fighting. Eric Cantona kind of stood, stood up um, on the top of the cage as well, shouting out orders and couldn't understand a word he was saying in the advert. Let's have a little listen. 24 elite players hold a secret tournament with eight teams and only one rule. The Oscar wins. takes you back (laughs) takes you back what was going on in the world of football at the time then around 2002 so uh in the premier league arsenal win their second of three league titles under arsene wenger uh, going the season without losing an away game and sealing the league title at old trafford with a goal from sylvan wiltors yeah uh a a classic arsenal team really um i mean so they went the season 
without losing an away game. So this is not the invis- Invincibles, but that's not bad, is it? Yeah, yeah. I think that well, first Premier League team to do so as well. And um, I think they lost three three home games around that time as well. And they'd actually win, get a domestic double as well. Their second in four years, winning the FA Cup final 2-0 against Chelsea. Just a, like you say, a classic, classic team. It's probably my favourite Arsenal team that I've ever watched. Yeah, did did. did. They only win three titles under under Arsene Wenger. Yeah, so it was 98, 2002 and 2004. You th- you'd think it's more, don't you? Yeah, he was there for a long time, not competing for any titles, though, to be fair. That's, that's, that's a bit crazy, but well, congratulations to Arsenal. <laughs> I think as well, my favourite bit about this is because you've got players like Pires and Jumberg, you know, Vieira and Parler, again, playing really well, Burkamp and Henri, and I know most of those players were around for the Invincibles, but he just felt a bit newer. Like Campbell had just joined at that point after he making his big move away from Spurs. Yeah, sponsored by Dreamcast as well. Dreamcast. I mean, I do love that Arsenal kit. There's a, there's a gold one that they're sponsored by Sega as well, which, yeah. I, which I do quite enjoy. But I, I think it's the perfect blend of those 90, 98 and 2004 teams with lovely football, physical, That's flair fair. players. And, and Freddie Jumberg, to, to me, was like a, a player to watch like coming through discovering football. And, yeah. and actually, that little red Mohican that he took to the World Cup as yeah. well, it, it just felt like a nice little, nice time for it. Sylvain Wiltor was a great player as well, scored some big goals for France. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then, you, like you say, you've got Henri coming into his real peak here, Pires as well, who was, I think he was Footballer Writers Player of the Year as well, and he was injured in February or something like that. So the impact well, he must have had early in that season. Well, we've looked at the top of the table, Arsenal reigning supreme. Uh, down the bottom uh, that season, we would see Derby County, Ipswich Town and Leicester City relegated. So, uh, well, Ipswich and Derby seem a long way from uh, Premier League uh, teams now. I know Derby's different circumstances, but um, obviously Leicester would be, well, they're an absolute staple of the Premier League now. I, I, I guess there's not really too much to say. I mean, Ipswich seemed to have a bit of an interesting story behind behind their relegation. Yeah, so Ipswich had finished fifth in the previous season. Um, that, that is a drop. Yeah, that really is. I think it was, um, yeah, they had a couple of good players and they just kind of took the lead by surprise, really. Um, but a year of playing European football and they're kind of bubble bursting in the league, they, they went down, even though they'd end up playing the UEFA Cup again the following season due to their fair play. Crazy. So imagine fair play. Yeah, so like there was a thing. I don't know if it's still a thing now. Where if you had certain amount of your best discipline in the league, you would go into like I think it was like an Intertoto, or you'd go up to the League Cup for a or sorry the UEFA Cup for a, for a period as well. I think Fulham got through it one year doing that. Yeah, that make that makes sense. Um, I think they've stopped it now. Um, yeah, I'm just looking. 2015, 16. I think they stopped it. Bring it back. <laughs> just is it just because the Premier League wasn't as foully as everybody everywhere else at that point? It's such a weird one. Like imagine like going into the last game of the season and being like tenth, but go, like no yellow cards. Yeah, yeah, no yellow cards, and we can do it today. We can get into the UEFA Cup. Maybe if they bring that back today, it can be most corners goes to the Conference League. Yeah, the UEFA Conference could happen. <laughs> most corners goes to the Conference League. <laughs> UEFA Conference, yeah, yeah. Or we could do we could do most throw ins. Most and you have to <laughs> you have to play in like the the country's third tier that's opposite you on the on the globe I if you, you believe in a circular I thought, you, I thought you were gonna say like in pro you know when you win like you get like an achievement and you can play on like birds and stuff yeah yeah <laughs> you got it you're in the league but it's this league it's the comedy league here no I'm, th- I'm thinking if you got a map and picked the country that was opposite you on not a map, sorry, on a on a globe. Mm. You pick the country that's opposite to you. You have to play in their third league if you get the most throw-ins, <laughs> which isn't even on you. That's no. on other teams. Stoke, Stoke would have done well, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah, well, back they would. In, back but you the could day. punish your opponent. You could be like, right, we're just kicking it out for throw-ins all day and you're <laughs> going to go and play in bloody Mexico next year. <laughs> Sounds like a nice little trip, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, speaking of you know, globe trotting. I was going to say, we got really sidetracked. Well done, well done on bringing it back. Uh, speaking of globe trotting in year, Real Madrid beat Bayer Leverkusen two one in the Champions League final at Hampden Park with one of the great goals in in finals from Zinedine Zidane. Yeah, we all remember that. Surely it's it's being clipped and will be clipped forever and a day. It's um, it's odd to see Bayer Leverkusen. They they've really never really reached those heights again. I'm pretty sure. No, I think well the, the team they had as well was was pretty special. It's one I always kind of think back on and go, God, the amount of players that they had. Like he played in this team. Like you've got Michael Balak with his first big role and 
his breakout season when he go and play for Germany at this World Cup. You had Zé Roberto, Bashturk, Lucio, who plays in this game, uh, Ramelo, Placent, uh, Neuville and Berbatov was there too. Berbatov? A very young Berbatov. Say. Yeah, yeah. I can't imagine such a thing. No, he's just always been like 29, hasn't 20, he? Yeah. 29, yeah. slick back hair and all that. But they, um, but Bayern Leverkusen, Bayern Leverkusen that year, they um, lost the Champions League final, also lost the German Cup final and lost the Bundesliga on the last day of the season. <laughs> Christ. So the worst treble you've ever seen in your life. What could have been? Eh? Where did Balak go after them? Did he go to Chelsea or did he have a little Bayern Munich stop off? I think he, yeah, he had a Munich stop off. So he may have stayed for another year, but after his performances at the World Cup, it was just like, yeah, you're not, you're not going to be there for much longer, are you? Crazy, isn't it? Bayern Munich is like one of those weird clubs where they're clearly one of the best clubs in Europe, but it's a bit like PSG. I think you, you maybe have to leave that league to truly test yourself because you, you're just playing for a team where everything's so weighted in their favour. I, th- I think so. And it's, it's strange because, again, one of the biggest clubs in the world, most storied clubs as well, but because the rest of the league probably isn't up to their standard and hasn't been for some time now, you kind of think, well, actually, if you're a bigger Premier League club or you're Real Madrid, Barcelona, you probably can try and take some of their players. And, and it has worked over the years. Again, Chelsea taking Mike, the German captain Michael Ballack from them. Yeah. Well, Nick, uh, I've just realised this is the first proper tournament game. Yeah. No discredit to the Nations League. <laughs> or proper Heritage World Cup Euros. This is the first proper tournament game that we've, we're covering. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an exciting one. It's from the um, it's South Korea and Japan, is that right? Yeah. The 2002 World Cup. Um, hazy memories, like just being a young kid, so excited. England have a cool kit. David Beckham's got a cool mohawk. Mm-hmm. Some great players. Uh, really weird kickoff times that work so much better when you're a kid. Yeah. Because you just what you, you're going to get a bit of time off school in the morning, maybe, or you'd get in from school because obviously school finishes early than our full time jobs will as adults, <laughs> and and you can just pick up the afternoon game and then the evening game. Uh, it started off with uh, Senegal beating France, if I'm right. Yeah, yeah, the opening game, Senegal, and I think it's Papa Bouba Diop scored the, the only goal, and, and a lot of France's players were eligible to play for Senegal. That's what was, you know, the nice and tasty about it, and, you know, what a big shock to open the tournament. Yeah, I mean, France had won the World Cup and the year I was going into it, and there was no reason for it to stop. No, no. And I, for me, this, I know everyone always says it, but your first World Cup's your favourite. To me, this is my favourite World Cup because there's so many shocks, there's so many stories. It's, you know... Yeah, that's not a bad shade at all. It's one of one of the better ones. And uh, in a, in, it takes place in a country where, you know, there is some football history, well, across two countries where there is some football history, but even even... Though today we take both of those teams as being like a given for being at the World Cup. I think it was one of those where the, they did the self-proud in how they hosted it and how the, they welcomed football and, and the you know the displays of their own teams. Absolutely, yeah. I think Japan got to, I think they were in the first knockout round maybe. And then I think South Korea lost in the semi or quarterfinals. I think they lost in the semifinals to Germany actually. Crazy. Well, how did England get there then? We want to have a little look back as we do the build up to the uh, the game from both uh, from the perspective of both teams. So, England. Um, it was a dramatic one, wasn't it? We all remember how England qualified on the on the last flipping kick <laughs> of of the um, of the qualifying campaign. Can we go back a little bit further than that to get a bit of context? Yeah. So it, um, even the start of the uh, qualification was in dramatic fashion. You had Sven Goran Eriksson taken over from Kevin Keegan after the first qualifying game after um, England lost at Wembley to Germany. Yeah. Uh, qualification went down to the final day and David Beckham, you know, salvaged the last grasp, uh, last cast draw against uh, Greece at Old Trafford. Just one of the great England moments, isn't it? You'll always watch it if you're scrolling through Instagram or scrolling through Twitter and, and it's been shared because it's X amount of years since or just happy birthday, David Beckham, yeah. goes from the England account. You'll always watch that goal and it just, it, he was just a man on a mission in that game. Well, 
if anyone asks you why football keeps people coming back and coming back, then you've had it all today. I said if anyone can pick a goal out, well, he's already a hero, but my goodness, where does this elevate him to? It's a quite exquisite free kick. He's totally baffled the goalkeeper. He doesn't know whether it's going to his right, his left. Beckham picks the perfect moment, the perfect opportunity, and England must surely be through. I've seen a lot of pieces recently over the last couple of years of, oh, actually, was he very good that day? And he played in the middle of the park. And, you know, as we as we see, as we do more England games, he, he kind of doesn't have a great positional sense. But in that game, he was doing, for better or worse, everything. And he genuinely dragged England like, to that result. Well, England nearly had to, even with that result, England nearly had to go through a playoff. Um, they finished level on points with Germany, but uh, G- Germany slipped up on the last day, drawing themselves uh, with a nil-nil draw to Finland. So it it could have been different. Oh, absolutely. And and that's what's the strange thing is that there's a game that goes on after that Beckham free kick mm. in that day. And you just think, oh, imagine if Germany would have gone through. I feel like the way the the points have fell. Actually, no. I, I'm just looking at the table here. Mm. Is it possible that if, if England wouldn't have got that goal and say Finland would have beat Germany... I think England would have, England would have gone through still. England had to basically better or equal Germany's result. Yeah, yeah. So even though Germany go into that game knowing they all they've got to do is beat Finland, do you know they finish third in the group and they you know kind of respectfully done their thing it is, yeah, was was very odd with that. But that just shows how big that five one win was in Germany. I mean, the goal difference swing. Well, is I'm just huge. looking at the goal difference here, plus ten for England. Yeah, you can pl- pretty much pin that down to one game, can't you? Yeah, yeah. The uh, one of the games that we would we'd always want to do, but we just want to keep you hanging on for that one. Yeah, yeah. You will wait. <laughs> you will wait for five one. <laughs> Uh, we were just talking about Beckham and, uh, as always with England, around this time and this era. He was our talisman, and when you put so much emphasis on one individual player, they're going to get injured. Oh, very much so, aren't they? Um, yeah, famously broke his metatarsal in a Champions League game against Deportivo. Um, injury was expected to take between four and six weeks to heal, um, with another two and four weeks needed for rehabilitation. So, so far out from that, there was already, oh God, our best player, in his form of his life, really, as well. Yeah, so that's you're talking about potentially a 10-week, uh, you know, uh, rest and heal and rehab for, for him. And that's right to the wire, isn't it, for the tournament? And that's then, then not match fitness. That's not getting yourself back in it. That's rehabilitation. So you can just run. Bas- basically run and train again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the country went absolutely mental, didn't they? This was idolization and God tier, uh, you know, love on a different level. It's kind of embarrassing to look yeah. back, I think. I, I think so, yeah. It's it's very strange, especially the way that the press had treated Beckham and a lot of the country had, you know, a couple of years earlier when you'd got, you know, people putting his face on a dartboard yeah. and, and, you know, burning Having effigies, effigies yeah. of him. And But, you know, in, in comparison, you've got, you know, Yuri Geller and national newspapers, you know, playing silly buggers with, like, you know, a picture of his foot on the on the front and just saying, yep, stroke this for good luck. It's he'll just always, crazy. He'll always show up on the old Yuri. Yeah. <laughs> for these events. Yeah, he's not the only um, player to, to be injured over Beckham. Um, Gary Neville injured, so we have to get Danny Mills in at right back. Um, you know, up up until this game, we're not going to spoil this game just yet. But uh, Danny Mills played well in the, in this tournament. Yeah, yeah, I think he I think he done all right. He may I think in the Sweden game there's maybe a bit of an error for for a goal, but I think he he done as good as you'd expect really. He'd had a good season at Leeds, who'd done okay, but I, I think that steady presence of Gary Neville was probably wanting to be found at a couple of points. But you know, you'd also got Stephen Gerrard, um, who you know shone in qualifying and formed a good partnership with Paul Scholes in midfield. Yeah, he was that, he was injured as well. For that's this. a that's a huge loss. I mean, he, we we remember the Germany game, the five one game, and him kind of coming to life in that for England. You would have thought this would be his tournament, but injured, and even his replacement, Dan, uh, Danny Murphy, was injured. So we're we're talking Paul Scholes and Nicky Butts. I mean, that's not bad uh, strength in depth, really, but. You yeah. lose a lot of dynamism in a drop off from Gerard to to Nicky Butt. I, th- I think so. Yeah, I mean Nicky Butt was you know very solid as the tournament went on and, and received a lot of praise for his performances once he came into the team and maybe gave it a bit of balance. But that next level of an, an exciting emerging Stephen Gerrard breaking through the team and yeah. and contributing to going forward as well. That's I think that's really something they miss. And then you can't then bring in a Butt or a Murphy to kind of so, you know, solidify midfield either. No, and we get to the tournament though. Thank you, David Beckham, for that. Uh, we're in uh, what was deemed the group of death. 
We're against Nigeria, Sweden and Argentina, drawing our first uh, game of the tournament 1-1 against the Swedes. Sol Campbell doing as he will and thumping home a header. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, he always had one of those in him, didn't he? Most of them were disallowed. I was going to say, I think this is his only ever England goal. Yeah, which is, yeah. It's just balmy because you can think of two off the top of your head that, <laughs> that like he scored and weren't allowed to happen, basically. Yeah, we always, we're always playing Sweden as well around this time, kind of like the Croatia of, of the day. Yeah, that's pretty accurate, really. I think they, England played them at the next World Cup as well, and maybe even, I think they were in, yeah, in the 2000 for the, for the Euros, they were in qualifying group with them as well, so it was a real we're, bogey team for England. We're playing them up until 2012, when Danny Welbeck and Andy Carroll scored as well. And actually, 2018, they met England too. Oh, yeah. So there, there, is a bit, there is a good history there, and I don't think England actually win that many games against Sweden. It's quite rare. I imagine there would have been so much um, hype from the press on Sven's nationality ahead oh, of that game. Oh, God, yeah. Lots, lots of pictures of Arika and God knows what and double agents. Yeah, it would have been tiresome, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, So, but we draw the opening game 1-0, and, uh, 1-1, sorry, and then it's a huge, huge, huge game, which we're definitely going to cover. Um, it's England versus Argentina. Yeah, just enormous. I in, to me, I, wa- I remember watching this at home. So I don't know if it was Same. on a Saturday. Must have been on a Saturday. So I, I, yeah, I mean, we'll get to it when we do cover it one day. But I, I just remember. I thought we got the day off school or something, but surely not. So it must have been a Saturday or a Sunday this game. And I remember watching it, and you know, the iconic uh, commentary of um, hold was it hold your hold your teas or oh yeah, hold, yeah. hold your tea cups. You can smash them now. Beckham yeah. scored. You know, brilliant and. We've even bought the DVD for this so we can make sure we're watching it. All the extras, everything. Yeah, even if the internet is, is defeated and goes down, we're still going to record and we'll just put it, put it out nowhere, but at least we're going to watch it because we've got the DVD. Exactly. Uh, go, we, go through and, we go through an absolute style with finesse. We have a nil-nil draw against Nigeria. <laughs> that must have got everyone hyped. I don't remember that game at all. I, I think that took place on a weekday. and I don't think anyone was allowed to watch it at our school. God I, damn it. I remember, I'm, again, you just, it was one of those games where you're hearing what's going on while it's going on. I mean, in reality, I don't think England were going to lose to Nigeria. And I think a draw was always going to be good enough because Sweden knocked Argentina out on the same day at the same time too. Yeah, and we, we'd go through to face Denmark in the first knockout round. Um, they, they'd uh, come out from a tough group, including France, Uruguay and Senegal. I mean, that looks like more, more like a group of death than ours. It, I mean, that's I mean, France and Argentina would seen as the two favourites. Denmark, I don't think they were fancied to do much. Senegal I think you, you, all. Yeah, I think Uruguay were probably a bit quieter in this era than they are now. Yeah, I think in well, well, yeah, we'll see on their World Cup qualifying very shortly. They um, they finished fifth, so I had to go through like an intercontinental playoff. So it wasn't a great Uruguay team. Maybe you know a couple of years before they started peaking. So uh, to to qualify for the chance of playing Brazil, we uh, smashed Denmark three um, 0 First half goals from Ferdinand, Owen, and Heskey. I remember Ferdinand's little dance and his strange goal, <laughs> and Heskey smashing it in from quite a bit of distance. And then the headline in the sun the next day, probably the best team in the world. I mean, that is such a stretch, isn't it? Yeah. I know I know it's because it's Denmark and, and whatever the beer advert, but it's just like, wow, that is that is getting everybody pumped up at this point. Brazil would probably think, well, we've got quite a good claim to being probably yeah. the best team in the world. <laughs> uh, so how did, how did they get to the World Cup? Uh, so they'd struggled through qualification and starting in March 2000, when they drew nil-nil uh, in Colombia. Uh, but it was you know before the campaign, the troubles really started when Ronaldo fit to picked up the first of his big uh, career-threatening injuries. Right, okay. So, well, I mean, he, he's always had injury problems, hasn't he? Even pre-sort of France 98, and then obviously from the final, that th- was a bit of an injury as well. I but. think he, I think before France, I think he, if he had anything, it was only ever very niggly and it wasn't too, you know, too dangerous because he was still that phenomenal player. He just basically run through you at breakneck speed, yeah. but he was such a, he was still quite slim then as well, so he just couldn't ever stop his feet and where he was going, but... It's just after, isn't it, when it really starts to take its toll, all these injuries. Yeah, so it's November 99 uh, to March 2002. He'd miss over 100 games for Inter, a total of 750 days injured. Um, You're missing like 30 games a season at that point. What the hell? It's just mad, isn't it? With um, the worst of these injuries, when he ruptured his patella, uh, turning him into, you know, from one of the most one of the most exciting young players that you know the world's ever seen into you know, more of a clinical goal scorer as we see him in, enter the tournament. What's a patella? I think it's on your. I want to say it's on your knee somewhere. I mean, 
Again, not a doctor. Didn't do well at any of that <laughs> kind of stuff. It's so. a small bone located in front of the knee joint. Uh, okay. Yeah, it was always knee injuries with, with Ronaldo, wasn't it? So he'd had to adapt his game. Brazil kind of shakily getting uh, through their qualifying group. Um, he, he was an... But I'm guessing he wasn't a big fixture in that if he's missing lots of games for Inter. No, no, not much. Um, yeah, Brazil didn't start well. They'd only win three other open seven games. Um, the look changes when Romario comes back in for a little while. I mean, Romario in like 2001 seems way too late for him, but he comes back into the Scott side and scores seven goals in two games. Ooh. Pure Romario, that, isn't it? I reckon it must have only been five and he's just lied. Yeah, <laughs> stick a couple more on. Yeah. Nobody will notice. Stick a couple more on. <laughs> After the uh, the initial burst, they struggle again uh, and almost threw away qualifying on the uh, towards the end. They only uh, well, they failed to win five of their last eight games, but managed to scrape over the line on the last day. So from that uh, massive South American qualifying group, Argentina, Ecuador, Brazil, Paraguay and Uruguay, well, they got to the playoff, but those are the ones going through. I mean, you look at the teams who didn't qualify, Colombia, Bolivia, Peru, Venezuela and Chile, and you... You surprised Brazil were you know allowed the, some, themselves to struggle, but Colombia are right up there, aren't they? They could they could have took it. Yeah, and it's strange because in Chile, you'd think of them at the previous World Cup with um, Zamorano and Salas, and you know some good players there. They they bottom of that uh, qualifying. I, I I just think Argentinian and Brazilian stories when they go through World Cup qualification are always so interesting because there's always a worry of oh will they won't they and it would just not feel right without one of them at a World Cup. Yeah, well, what doesn't feel right as well is Brazil not being really fancied as one of the big, um, you know, favourites to win the World Cup. Uh, you just think by proxy that they, they, they just always are. But so much around Ronaldo and how important he is and how unfit um, he is, you know, due to injuries. Um, but they, they, you know, they get off to a tough start as well against Turkey. A, a famous game for all the wrong reasons, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... In football terms, they'd fall behind to a hash and chass goal uh, before Ronaldo equalised and with a penalty before, with three minutes to go, Rivaldo scored and, yeah, put them through with three points. Yeah, well, Ronaldo, there he is, turning up. What were you worried about? Yeah, exactly. Up, day one, straight in with the goal, uh, Rivaldo scoring uh, the penalty to seal it. But um, Rivaldo was... Everyone can remember what we're going to say next. What, what do you think, Nick, about yeah. this, this infamous dive or... Oh, what, play acting, what do you even call it? Yeah, it's just very silly, isn't it? I, I don't think you'd quite get that today because you've obviously got VAR that's able to look at things, so they may be able to think they can get away with things more. But basically, um, Uncel kicks the ball at Rivaldo, it hits his knee and immediately goes down, clutching his face. And you'd see it on all the kind of the TV shows. That's the intro clip and football's funniest moments and things like that. But he's, yeah. I think I think he was fined, actually, for this afterwards, which seems very strange, like even of this era to be fined fine for diving essentially people just hate diving don't they yeah yeah they can st stand absolutely anything apart from spitting and diving <laughs> you can do whatever you want you can be Luis Suarez and say whatever you want but you know diving is unacceptable they'd get through the um the rest of the group quite easily a 4-0 win over uh China and a 5-2 win against Costa Rica so uh they, they've kind of been given um what would you was it almost the space to just ease themselves into this tournament amid all, amidst all this chaos, allow players like Ronaldo to to um, grow into it, allow play, players like Ronaldinho to settle and presume it's got to be his first tour World Cup tournament. Yeah, yeah. I think he's still got quite a lot of caps at this point. So I think he'd been around, Ronald, Ronaldinho that is, around since around 99. He played a lot of like Copper America and maybe even some Olympic games. So he's, he'd played a lot for Brazil, but not in a World Cup, as you'd say. I think his emergence was just after France 98. I mean, they start off very well, the three R's as they're, as they're known as. I mean, Ronaldinho scored one, had an assist in the, the group stages. Rivaldo scored three, assisted two. Ronaldo scoring four, like you say, what we worried about. Yeah. Oh, God. It it, can't, it makes me nostalgic just to see Brazil. So, I mean, they're going to be back this year, you know, no doubt about that. But that just seemed a level above everyone else in football at times in the late 90s, early 2000s. Especially, like, for me, this year, looking back, you just go, OK, of course, Brazil was such a good team. But as we say, they, they really weren't fancied at all. You, you had Argentina and, and France, who were big favourites. You had Italy, who people thought were going to do something. Portugal were, again, a golden generation just coming through as well. But you, when you look at... Some of the Brazil line, if you go, that's a very strange that Roque Junior was playing yeah. after, after he got a Leeds and things like that. 
Well, after the group stages, Brazil get through to the knockout to the face. Belgium in what would be probably world's number one versus world's number two ranked yeah, teams. Now, yeah. Belgium aren't anywhere near what we would class them as these days, but then they uh, gave Brazil a little bit of a fright. Yeah, yeah, they had a, a goal harshly disallowed for a push by uh, Mark Vilmot um, early on. Um, although Rivaldo soon put that right, giving Brazil the lead with a goal at first glance. Looks like the most beautiful and devastating goal of the tournament, but when you actually see it, it's just a massive deflection. <laughs> I love that the little trick of the little trick of the mind and I, little trick of the eye. Sorry, um, I always think with players like one. Um, Riv- this, this seems like I've made this up because of the <laughs> context for the rest of the episode. Spoilers, if you know, you know. <laughs> but um, sometimes with players like that, it's like, uh, it's a massive deflection, but they may have even thought about having that massive yeah. deflection in there. And, and it takes balls to try crazy shots like that. And sometimes you just, you, 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 you know, you get something, you get a goal because you're just that brave and that ballsy to, to try. You make your own look. Yeah, it's you make your own look. Yeah, one yeah. Of those things, isn't it? So, um, yeah, Rivaldo had kind of gone through and put them, you know, one nil up, um, and then yeah, Ronaldo seals the deal with them. With Cleberson sides it across to him for his fifth of the tournament, and, and Brazil are through. Yeah, so Brazil are through with a two nil win over Belgium, um, and England are through with a three nil win over Denmark, and the stage is set. Really, hysteria sweeps across the entire country. Um, yeah, but it, it just felt like, wow, we get to play Brazil. Yeah. And you know what? This is me as an 11-year-old. We're the best team in the world, actually. <laughs> the and, sun says so. Yeah, and why would they lie? They're, they're journalists. <laughs> no, so it's got to be checked, that, hasn't it? Yeah. Uh, hysteria. I mean, God, it's, it's still exciting now to think about it, looking back. Um, and it's a Friday morning. Yeah, Friday my 7th. I think maybe 7.30, actually a kickoff. It's a strange 30, 7.30 time. Oh, my God. A Friday night. Uh, sorry, not the Friday night, the Thursday night. <laughs> Better than Christmas. <laughs> Just nerves going into that. Yeah. But knowing you've got to watch it at school, though, that's a thing for us. I'm trying to think of if I was an adult now. What What would you do, you mean? You're not going to get anything done, are you, that day? <laughs> You're going to have a point. Yeah, well... Yeah, you are, aren't you? Yeah. At that point, on a I'm, Friday, you've got to just book the day off and you must be in the pub at like 6 a.m. <laughs> I'm presuming that we had decent weather. Well, I don't know why I'm presuming that we had decent weather, but it's absolutely blistering that the game is and it's the brightest thing ever. Yeah. I, I've, I've got no memory of getting to school that day. I remember watching it in our canteen at school, then having to go to like, I think it was like business or in the afternoon, like in the second half. So we all had to like go through into business, sit and watch it on like the big screen. And um, I remember, like, we all were just banging the table so hard. I think that the table morphed. Like, yeah. Like, it went, like, you had, like, the little, br- <laughs> you had, like, the little bristly bits that's that were on the that's table. That's schoolyard bullshit right there. There no, was no, no way. Seriously, I remember, like, the table was absolutely flat, and you had, like, the bristly bits where all the crap kind of went down, and you'd been rubbing or yeah, something yeah. like that. And I remember the table, it kind of, like, morphed up. And I remember, like, coming back, like, years later and just being, like, that's that table we broke that no one's replaced. <laughs> We've got a few more stories like that, but some of them include spoilers, so we'll we'll get to them a bit later on. Yeah, uh, yeah pe- definitely. People's uh, memories of the game. Um, let's go into the lineups then. Um, I'm happy to take the um, opposition today oh, for once. Okay, fair enough. Do you want me to read out the England lineup then? Yeah, go on. So you had uh, David Seaman in goal, Danny Mills at right back, centre back pairing of Ferdinand and Campbell, Asher Cole at left back. You had David Beckham uh, right wing, Nicky Button, Paul Scholes in the centre of midfield, and Trevor Sinclair out wide left. And you had Owen and Heskey, trusted partnership up front. Okay, uh, we've got a, a, an immense bench, and just in terms <laughs> of quantity, I can't believe how many players there are. Uh, do you want to? <laughs> Give the, give the listeners a bit of insight. Yeah, yeah. So goalkeepers David James and Nigel Martin. You had Wayne Bridge, Wes Brown, Martin Keown, Gareth Southgate. You had Joe Cole, Kieran Dyer. Um, Owen Hargreaves may not have been on the bench. I think he was injured in... Well, he was definitely injured early on in the tournament. But you had Robbie Fowler, Teddy Sheringham and Darius Vassell on the bench too. Okay. That, that seems like fair. Um, I probably wouldn't be taking any of the players on the bench and starting them. <laughs> Well, it was um, it was interesting because you had you um, England had now got a settled side after the Argentina game because I think Owen Hargreaves had had started both the warm up games. You know, obviously, you know, shed loads of changes at half time, so really he's only playing half a game. But as well, he started the Sweden game and he'd started the Argentina game, which I'd 
totally forgotten. Hargreaves? He, yeah, yeah. Christ. And he would have only been young, early 20s around this point, and he goes off 19 minutes in, obviously injured against Argentina. Oh, yeah. He, has, he had an injury in him, didn't he, even as a, a younger man? Just a bit, yeah. I, I'm looking at the lineup here, and I'm thinking, you know, fair enough. Um, three massive uh, downgrades, really. Oh, well, not massive downgrades. Actually, he's one of them. Even a day. So Danny Mills, you wouldn't you wouldn't be putting him him in with all injuries and what have you not existent. Gary Neville would be there. No, you. So didn't. we're playing with a backup there. Yeah. And uh, Nicky Butt in midfield. You'd obviously have Stephen Gerrard there. Definitely. Who who would be on the left? I think I think the the issue was they I think they were playing Emil Heskey on the left at the start on the first opening games and there was a, <laughs> and there was we've, a, we, we've seen him do stuff like this before. <laughs> So he, because I think he kind of was playing there a bit for Liverpool. I think he'd not long moved there as well. So I think they were still kind of messing around with what the formation would be. But Sinclair, I think, comes on in the Argentina game and, and kind of cements his place, really. I mean, you also had uh, Darius Vassell, who'd also been kind of playing up front in the warm-ups with Heskey on the wide too. Yeah, uh, in in my memory, um, Mills and Sinclair both had great tournaments. Maybe it was just the, the lack of expectation placed on them. I remember being at school on, you know, on the football on the playground and being like, wow, they're playing so good. <laughs> these guys, these idiots I don't know about. Yeah, I, I think they came in and did a pretty solid job, really, especially when, you know, you, you do look at that bench and you think it's a bit thin, isn't it? Yeah. In terms of quality. Obviously, um, striking options, there's quite a few there, really, aside from Heskey and Owen, uh, Robbie Fowler, Teddy Sheringham, Doris Vassell. That's that's not bad. There's, and you're also missing Andy Cole, who would have gone to Blackburn around this time as well. You know, still a prolific goal scorer for England. Obviously, no Shearer from two years previously at the Euros. Yeah, I don't think he was. I don't think he was getting in this squad. <laughs> even if, even if, although I remember there being talk about him coming back because if Beckham would have been injured, if he were to come back in as captain and play, I mean, yeah, it was yeah. it was you know sort of two phases, and it felt like he was done with England. But once he quit England, he um, quit sounds harsh. But once he stopped playing for England, yeah. Um, his, his form soon shot up again, so there you go. Um, I'll go for the Brazil lineup then. Okay. In goal, Marcos, um, a three at the back, Lucio, Roque Jr. and Ed Milson, with Cafu, uh, right wing back, and Roberto Carlos, left wing back. Uh, Gilberto and Cleberson in the middle of the park, with Ronaldinho, Ronaldo, and Rivaldo up top. Just that front three, just, you know, same again. It's just so good, isn't it? Yeah. Well, hold on. We'll go, we'll go in deeper <laughs> shortly. Uh, bench, this might get a little bit funny. Uh, Dida, uh, Rogerio Seni, Lucio, Ricardinho, Giuliano Belletti, Anderson Polga, Junior, Danielson, Vampetta, Juninho, Edilson, Louis, Luazio, Luizio? Luizao, I think that is. Luizao and Kaka. Yeah. Some big names on that bench. The, Some, the Kaka as well. You, like, for him to be on that bench, it just seems weird. There is a shot later in the game where you do see him and you're just like, wow, that's Kaka at that age there. Yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, when I said I look at England and I see, um, the, well, three, two or three players, I'm like, they didn't really have an England career at the starting. On this, I see about five certified living legends. Cafu, Carlos, Ronaldinho, Ronaldo, Rivaldo. And all you, some of the best players of their generation. Oh, absolutely. I mean, what Lucio would kind of carry on to do in his career as well, being part of um, oh, yeah. Jose Mourinho's um, treble winning team at Inter, but a really solid career for him. I mean, Gilberto goes to Arsenal and, and really changes how they play as well with two screeners playing in midfield in that 2004 side too. Even on the bench, uh, Danielson, obviously yeah, at one yeah. time a world record breaking player. Uh, in terms of uh, transfer fee. Janinho as well, a great player. Kaká, as we've mentioned. Dida, who would be a, a keeper for them for a, lo a long time. Giuliano Belletti as well. I didn't realise he was getting games around this time too, that before he moved to Chelsea. Is Anderson Polga uh, Anderson from Manchester United fame? <laughs> no, no, unfortunately not, no. Kleber Kleberson would go on to be a United player as well, wouldn't he? He would. The United would sign him off the back of this World Cup. So I remember it was all the big talk was, would Ronaldinho go to Manchester United? And kind of you know over, and become the big player there, but it you know, never really happened. And he ends up going to Barcelona a couple of years later. And I always remember um, seeing an, a documentary almost about the first year under the port with Barcelona, and they couldn't believe that Man United had pulled out of the deal for him. They just said we thought he was going, he was gone. So crazy. Uh, I, I like the formation as well. I think it suits this team. You, you just let in those wing backs do a lot of the work. Sort of solid five with those two holding midfields and the three centre backs, and obviously the front three are just going to do absolute damage. I know, yeah. I I totally forgot they played a back three. I always thought it was a four with maybe an extra midfielder in there somewhere instead of the back four. But yeah, 
that, you know, Catherine and Carlos, they just get through so much work, don't they? Let's talk the um, the kits and anthems then, the the, um, the icing on the cake, so to speak, for, for anticipation and nostalgia. Uh, England's kit, uh, if you can try and picture it, dear listener, it's a, a classic white with a red stripe down the left-hand side. Yeah, yeah. As you say, maybe it's just because of nostalgia, as you say, but I, I think that's just a really smart England kit, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's unique. It's got, it's got just a simple feature that makes it stand out from the rest and not just be a plain kit. But... Um, it's, it's obviously just filled with nostalgia. I actually brought a replica um, for, okay. for um, from what's it? Is it what's, what's you, you know the shop where they sell them all? Yeah, yeah. What's no, it called? I can't think what it's called. First, I know first you. score or score draw? There's, there's so many, isn't there now? Yeah, I, I brought one, and and it's yeah, it just feels great. Are you, you giving a shout out to first score draw, whatever it's called, yeah. <laughs> and trying if, to get some England kits? If you pay us, I'll remember your name. <laughs> Simple. <laughs> we'll we'll complete the name when the check comes through. Yeah, I don't imagine we're going to get a sponsorship from Nike, <laughs> but they they're um, obviously repping Brazil's kit. Uh, I quite kind of like the well. They're wearing blue for a start, which is a shame. Yeah, can white and yellow work? Is it a bit too much of a? Mm, I, th- I think well, when you see the sun and the heat that's in this game, you can definitely say yeah, white and yellow would not have been a good mix really because the whole pitch looks bright yellow. That's true, but um, it's 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 okay, kit. But uh, the, for some reason, it looks dead baggy on all the Brazilian players. Yeah, it does actually, doesn't it? There's, I, there's a few kind of shortish guys in there, but maybe they're just like we're not making them that small. Yeah, yeah. I, I think as well, the problem is this was definitely like an identi kit that Nike used for a lot of other kits as well. So I think Portugal would have had the same kit around this time. South mm-hmm. Korea would have, and it's the exact same design as well, isn't it? And all they've done is just switch the colours. Yeah, I know. I know you're not a fan of the uh, the identi kit. No, I just don't think there's anything in it really. And, and you see it today as well. A lot of like, you know, maybe less high profile teams, they just get given the same kit as someone else. And Different colour. Yeah. And I think this era especially, it was just like you get it out the back of a 442 magazine, don't you? Well, England, um, the God Save the Queen National Anthem, doesn't matter how good your kit looks, that is an awful rendition. <laughs> So bad they sing it twice. Oh, yeah. Did you notice that? It's a second verse, isn't it, which no one's prepared for. Yeah, Even, yeah it's barely any players, England players are singing it. Um, the England fans are way too quick in it as well. Yeah. They're onto like, well, I don't think even though the, the second verse is coming, they just think, oh, it's the first verse again, we'll just do this this time. Yeah. Um, apparently it was a bit of an emotional one for Rio Ferdinand and that um, affected his game. Yeah, he said that he started welling up during the anthems and he, you know, kind of let it get into his head. And he, he said after that game, he, he approached football very differently where he said he didn't want to become too emotional about it. He tried to be a lot more colder and emotionless, focusing on the game. Sorry, when you said I didn't, he didn't want to, my, you know where my head went? <laughs> he went to The Undertaker. <laughs> he didn't want to become a parody of himself. <laughs> Real Ferdinand didn't. <laughs> he vowed that, so he did the Merck show, like the next World Cup. God, he, he has become a parody of himself. And I love Rio, but nobody can deny that that's uh, not true. Yeah. Uh, Brazil's anthem, uh, a lot of fun. I, I'm always jealous of, of, of a, a good uplifting sort of anthem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lot of because obviously we can't understand what they're they're saying, but there seems to be a lot of words in everyone else's anthems apart from England's kind of drone that goes on. Yeah, but they, I think it's more the look of, of Brazil that really got me in the build up. You know, they're very relaxed, confident, focused. They're kind of yeah, almost like kind of half smiling at each other, but at the same time, it's like yeah, we're getting involved now. The, the game is on. They're like, this is all right, isn't it? Nice yeah. sunny day. Yeah, yeah. And, and England are like, ne- ne- never Come worn this, on. never worn this blue kit before. This yeah, is interesting, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Looks smart. And you, Roberto. Oh, look at him. He looks rubbish in this. Just one more note on the anthem. You see uh, Gareth Southgate on the bench singing, and it, just, yeah. it looks like just the modern day man has just been transported into more casual wear in the, from the past. If you, apart from the beard, he pretty much looks exactly he the looks same. Looks exactly the same. Yeah. Again, you know, up until recently, just you know, his personality was the waistcoat, wasn't it? So yeah. even then, it's just like, well, I'll just carry on. Right. We, we're getting into it now. Hold on to your seats, folks, because it's England versus Brazil, World Cup 2002 quarterfinal. England and Brazil, of course, are hardly novices. And the English had already dispensed with Brazil's great rivals, Argentina. But the Brazilians were getting stronger and stronger through this tournament. Many predicted the overall winner would emerge from this game. John Motson's your commentator. First bit, of, first bit of action. Yeah, yeah. It's actually really positive for England. Yeah, they uh, immediately get a corner, don't they? Ashley Cole runs down the left-hand side and wins a corner. The, and you can hear the crowd straight away. I was just like, yes, this is, it started. We could score yeah. already. We're on the front foot. And, and it's like, obviously, around this time, England and so many teams, they'll just start from a kickoff, kick the ball back and then kick it, lump it forward. But there's somebody on the end of it. 
and, yeah. and then it turns into a corner. <laughs> Can you imagine? The points would have been up in the air. Straight away, yeah. Um, well, the corner doesn't really come to anything. Marcus just comes and punches the Beckham corner away. Um, he, he deals with it very quickly. Like, this is the thing. Like When Beckham delivers a corner, I've got to go and get this. Yeah, well, the, fir- the first three or four minutes, it is all England as well, even, even you know... That even if we didn't get the first minute goal, like we'd have all have loved. Uh, Brazil aren't really keeping the ball. England are being quite kind of sensible with it. I mean, the heat looks ridiculous. Mm. So um, I think Brazil may be trying to play a bit more calm and just keep the composure. Um, yeah, England looking like they, they want to exert a bit of control on the game. Could you ever really trust this England? They, they only really know to play full throttle. I think it's full throttle and then backs against the wall, isn't it? It's like, right, we've got our little spell. We, we have, we'll have, we've had our little spell. Now it's just, right, we've got to sit back and, and kind of defend this. Yeah, the first shot on target is uh, from England as well. Yeah, yeah, David Beckham with a free kick and Emma Heskey gets a header. It's again easily saved by Marcos. But again, Ooh. yeah, the, the crowd are just like, right, that's that's another one. That, yeah. count, that counts that as well. Yeah, we're getting closer. We're getting closer. Uh, Rivaldo tries a shot on five minutes. Quite speculative, quite long distance. But... Um, yeah, I, it, it just, again, it's just a little bit of a reminder. Oi, don't forget. Yeah. Don't forget who I am, right? <laughs> yeah. That might have gone wide, but I saw you all bricking it you know, <laughs> when I was going to shoot there. Yeah, I mean, his confidence from this guy, I mean, it's it's an awful shot in reality, but to even think, like we say, you earn your own luck with that kind of stuff as well. To even think about it, that chance, he's just at the top of his game for what he'd done at Barcelona. Yeah, uh, there's a little bit of a note that I I thought was funny anyway. Um, Paul Scholes plays a crossfield ball to Danny Mills, who can't meet it. He's absolutely pegging it, and then he just pegs it right back. (laughs) And then the camera cuts to Scholes, who looks absolutely (laughs) knackered. It is boiling. It's so hot there. And as we know, he's... uh, not a man whose complexion lends itself to sun, shall we say? No, no, he's um, yeah, he's really, he's really sweating six minutes in. Isn't he's he? kind of biting his tongue as well, as if they're just like, <laughs> he's just give me a minute. Yeah, just yeah, give me, give me a minute. Me a minute. Be all, be all right, but yeah, that was that was the first bit when I went, wow, Danny Mills is playing against Roberto Carlos. <laughs> it's, it's it's just a bit of a crazy one. I mean, well, big... Danny Mills and and David Beckham. Yeah, yeah, both, Dan, Dan. both trying to take on one of the best fullbacks ever. Yeah, yeah, I mean, big game for Beckham and Carlos. You know, they played each other a couple of years earlier when Real Madrid had not Man United out of the European Cup, and Carlos had pretty much come out and said that he didn't rate David Beckham in both games. He said he was he just dealt with him really well, slightly untrue. I think Beckham scored one of his best goals for Man United against Carlos in one of the games, but in reality, he'd done nothing on both legs. Yeah, first 10 minutes really even, uh, 11 minutes in, a chance nearly breaks for uh, Paul Scholes just outside the area, he shoots, uh, but it's deflected calmly back, uh, back to the Brazil defence, uh, England playing on the front foot there, and that could have been, if Michael Owen was nipping about, because it basically Scholes has a shot, and it gets so sort of wildly deflected that um, it ends up, the defender just runs in front of the keeper to pick it up, but it took all the pace out of it, the deflection. But um, yeah, they're on, they're on the fo- on the front foot, and the and the crowd are right behind them as well. Definitely, and you see Brazil start to take possession. You know, as the game kind of goes on, and you see that they are playing like a full on sweeper. There's one of the centre halves you can't quite make out who he is. I think it's Ed Milson. He's playing further back than the rest of the, the other two centre halves there, so just doing that sweeping up role too, which kind of like pushed the centre halves into the midfield to almost give you two more midfielders. So they're they're quite you know flexible this Brazil side as well. Tactics corner. Just yeah. a, just a note on the on the crowd. Um, do you think because there's a lot of um, uh, what would you call what would I say uh, people who aren't from England or Brazil, mm. so they're from the host nation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the crowd and um that the, a lot of them seem to be england f- supporting yeah, is that yeah. down to beckham i think so because this was clearly you know the the, the peak of david beckham, beckham mania. across the world he was you know one of the big footballers of this era because he would do so many adverts he'd be all over the place it was you know in english is an accessible language for a lot of other countries too but you've got like it's again also, yeah but you've got south korea and japan you know there's so many clips of them pretty much supporting england outside of their own games i mean yeah yeah so surprisingly, the the host nations have took England under the wing. <laughs> the first and only time that will ever happen for any tournament. It's just surprising that we've. I guess Ronaldo ha- wasn't on fire going into this tournament, but you'd be like, he's as no, nah, he's not. Is he? I was going to say he's as big a marketable presence as Beckham, and he's and he's just not. Well, even even when you look today, you know, for generations um, uh, currently as well, you you say Ronaldo. That's not the Ronaldo they're talking about. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, not to disparage, you know, one of the, genuinely one of the greatest players ever. But yeah. he was, you know, his star had fallen because of the injuries. 
and now this is his ascendancy back into you know the the mega star. We see the first flash of Ronaldinho around 12 minutes. He does a nice little skill to uh, get past Paul, Paul Scholes, but Scholes leaves a foot in. Brazil have a free kick with Roberto Carlos hanging over it. and um, Terrifying. That's a terrifying thing, isn't it? <laughs> um, he actually connects well, but it, it goes wide. Um, Danny Mills charges it down like he's just been given, like, like Beckham's gone, look, if I don't see you again, that's <laughs> fine, but I don't want to see that ball because he's just... He throws himself right onto it like it's a, like it's a bomb. <laughs> like a grenade. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Crazy. Fair play to Danny Mills. I mean, he looks hard, doesn't he? He's yeah. bold. He's bloody. He looks proper English. <laughs> he, he really does look so English, doesn't he? <laughs> it's, like, it's like Tom Carriage or something. Yeah, Brazil are getting a bit more um, bit more into the game. Uh, a couple of corners for them. David Seaman comes out to try and meet the second one, but it's a nervous punch. Uh, and it's headed out after that for a throw. Uh, England looking, you know... F- Absolutely fine, 15 minutes in. A little bit intimidated when Brazil attacked though, and, and you can understand that. On 16 minutes, England tried to break, but it ends up uh, with Heskey being the one who's trying to break with a full defence in, in, in front of him, and he's, he's not Michael Owen. Um, I mean, this was on the left wing as well, and it just again shows the... Uh, we, we, we're missing... Can, can I give you a hot take? We're missing a left wing player. Shut up. <laughs> really? really? Again, this I think this was the era of, again when we Steve McManaman wasn't quite in the team. I think he just kind of bowed out from playing for England. He came on in the five one actually, but maybe just at Real Madrid he was just happy not being around the England side anymore. He may have even picked up an injury before the tournament. I don't know, but yeah, well, he, we, his time kind of kind of gone already. Yeah. Hadn't it? I mean, he was still playing for Real Madrid, but it felt like he was more there just because he got on with everybody anymore, yeah. and he was just a good person to have around. You know, he he really took into to Spanish life as well. Yeah, um, Nicky Butt, you made a little comment on Nicky Butt at this stage, obviously giving a massive uh, job to do. Yeah, yeah, so um, he's playing in front of the back four for England, but you know, Brazil are finding the little gaps every now and then when you've got Ronaldo, Rivaldo, Ronaldinho all kind of playing a bit further back, not really on top of England's back four, so they can just run at them. I mean, he'd had a really good tournament, as I said, Pele in the build-up, um, so that Nicky Butt was the only player that get into the Brazil side, so a bit harsh. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe. there's two good centre halves there for England, which I, which I would say are better than Roque Junior. Yeah, and you know Ed Milson. I think Ed Milson is absolutely fine, but I think Fernand and Campbell. Maybe David Seaman. <laughs> <laughs> Your face. Then. Um, yeah. So uh, we hear a little bit of uh, we're on the ball. Yeah, yeah. It was quite nice. That really took me back. That did just hearing that nice inoffensive England song that was released again back then. You'd get a lot of singles that would come out. You got the official England anthem, the yeah. unofficial. Three Lions have done another version. You know, yeah, there's, there's get a, some like wacky, like almost like an anti. Yet they're still playing into it. Like yeah, yeah. Like I can't think of an example of that, but I bet we'll be able to find one. Yeah. Well, I think you got like a lot of was it Fat Les that had done done songs around <laughs> this time as well, and Keith Allen would have been a big part of that kind of stuff too. There was so much money to be made back then in comedy England songs that you just I literally can't even think <laughs> Gold of mine well w- w- I can't even remember what the last England song would have been that's not like genuinely think it would have been like Embrace or something in like 2006 I can think of Ooh, yeah no good uh, 18 minutes in we see the first shot from R9 uh, Ronaldo nice bit of play on the box between Rivaldo and Ronaldo uh, luckily the shot falls straight to David Seaman but it's a it's a scary sight, isn't it? Yeah, terrifying. They play a one-two and they get a shot away and you've seen Ronaldo so precise with his finishing, which is what he's had to become at this point because of his injury. And yeah, quite scary just seeing that. Like, just remember, we can do this. There's a little bit of a back and a forth, a little bit of needle between Ronaldinho and Ashley Cole and 20 minutes. Um, Ashley Cole wins the free kick, but you can tell he's visibly frustrated, whereas Ronaldinho is just kind of like smiling. It's like, hey, this is fun, isn't it? <laughs> Ashley Cole's just like, no. Let me do it. It's just a different breed, being so comfortable. Even a player like Ronaldinho who hasn't played for Brazil at this stage of a tournament. Mm. He's just like, I'm Brazilian, mm. and and this lot are also Brazilian. They're good. I'm good. Yeah, we're, we're gonna we're gonna do this. Uh, welcome to the pod, Ashley Cole. As well, just wanted to, wanted to say we've covered this era. Uh, before, but Ashley Cole wasn't playing. We had Wayne Bridge. Yeah, yeah, well, Wayne Bridge on the on our bench today. But yeah, Ashley Cole, such a stalwart in the England side. But England are struggling to do anything with the ball at this point. They seem too keen to get it up the pitch compared to Brazil, who are just taking their time, taking their time. But getting up the pitch uh, pays off in a big way for England. Heskey, Owen sprinting away to the left here against Lucio. Michael Owen for England. It's a great chance. And he scored! Michael Owen against Brazil in the World Cup! 
in the 23rd minute. England are in front. Michael Owen and England sizzling in the heat of Shizuoka. And after this, the sausages will be sizzling back home, I should think. Look at Owen here. It's Lucio who's made the mistake. And Trevor, the poacher's goal. Well, what can you say about this young lad? Lucio makes the error. Michael Owen has hardly had a touch in the game so far. He waits for the opportunity to get a chance like this. He's through on goal. At this stage, you think surely he's going to score. But he makes it look so easy. Just lifted it over Marcos. It's a wonderful bit of opportunism. He's waited 20... That's right. On 23 minutes, England lead Brazil. <laughs> oh, it's finally happened. Wow. <laughs> wow. Even watching this, uh, what, 20 years later mm. is... Um, is incredibly exciting. It's shocking as well, almost, when it happens, because there's just been nothing going on in the game at all for either side, really, especially from England. I mean, England have nothing. You know, they take the lead, skulls on the edge of the area, plays the ball forward to Danny Mills down the right. He's still near the halfway line. Comes to Heskey, who's you know, playing a lot deeper than Michael Owen, almost as like a number 10 at times, and receives the ball just on, you know, outside the centre circle and plays the ball forward. Um, Owen makes a run behind Lucio, who doesn't control Heskey's pass at all, bounces off his thigh, runs into the path of Michael Owen, and Michael Owen is on it like an absolute shot. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought this was a, quite an interesting goal to watch, actually, because England are in a, under a bit of pressure, and they play it out from the back almost, yeah. it, it kind of peppish. They're under pressure. And the, I mean, that is the most, you know, Aldi des- Pep you've ever seen, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Des- desperation Pep, sure. Because the, I don't think it was tactical. It was just like, oh God, oh you have it, oh God, oh you have it. And Wait then all I've, of a sudden... I've seen Danny Mills. Yeah. I'm going to put it to him. And it's, and, you know, it's it's a nice thought that he, Skulls has seen him. It's not the best pass, but it's just, you can almost hear the crowd go, good, we've got space, yeah, we yeah, can go yeah. forward again. It looked like too much space for me. And, and Heskey's ball wasn't great, but it made Lucio just kind of swerve his body in an unnatural way where he couldn't mm. control the ball and as you say it bounces off his knee Owen's oh, straight in like a shot a lovely composed finish and uh, England need what uh, England lead 1-0 I, th- I think as well with with the Owen thing that I found really interesting when you first look at it you go it's you know it's just a, a standard he's, he's through on goal he can go through but actually the touch he takes to both control the ball which is his first touch and put it straight into his path I mean when he actually takes the shot he's pretty much on the penalty area yeah like, well, on the penalty spot and he kind of gives him uh, Marcos the eyes as well. Like when you see where the ball finishes, it's bang in the middle of the goal as well. It is, yeah. It's it's a strange one, but great, great finish. Uh, John Watson, Nick. I mean, he's absolutely loving it as well, isn't he? One of our favourite commentators in the game. I know, yeah. It's enthusiastic, raspy voice as well. It's the way he kind of states what's happened. Like he, he can't quite believe it as well. It's Michael Owen against Brazil in the World Cup. <laughs> it's just so matter of fact that he's pinching himself. Like he's got like a checklist. Yeah, like that's what I wanted. Yeah, this this is all happening. In now it's and it, you go from back to front on that one so it's a world cup definitely a world cup <laughs> against brazil yep and it's michael owen yep i'm gonna say it and he even says england are in front he's yes. just like so so firm on it as well the sausages um you, you, yeah. you obviously made a note about how he, he says the sausages will be sizzling back home and in my mind up until just now reading it on on our notes i was thinking barbecue but he's talking breakfast sausages yeah in a, in a pan i can imagine motty there in a, like a cartoon pan with like bacon and uh, bacon and sausages just frying them up i mean yeah like, oh, like i don't know the sausages will be sizzling now like i'm gonna wait until 20 minutes <laughs> into the game then i'll start the sausages and if there's a goal i'm just gonna whack that heat up straight up onto six yeah. straight away get them going they're all bursting everywhere <laughs> today be like all oh, the the air fryers go in <laughs> yeah yeah the uh, overnight oats are getting cracked open now <laughs> granola bars are being crunched <laughs> just just with like a slight little bit about that owen finish as well i think you know it's a bad mistake from lucio of course it is but the time it's almost like a millisecond that owen takes to just actually in his stride you think he's going to clip it over him but it's just a second longer than you think it would be and yeah just He's so perfect at doing that kind of thing. That chance is made for him to make it look like, oh, wasn't anything to write home about. Yeah, well, well, well done, Michael Owen, well done, England. It's mm. been a pretty equal game. I didn't expect them to take a lead there. Have they poked the bear a bit too early, though? Um, there's still a long way to go. And, and just, a, just a moment later, it looks like the job was going to get, I mean, a lot harder because David Beckham goes injured. <laughs> Not one minute after England take the lead, for God's sake, <laughs> England's star man goes down injured and he's stretched off. 
Yes, I, I've forgotten this happened at all. So I think he's a bit of a collision with um, Ronaldo's down in the corner, tries to go past Beckham, which he does, and kind of loses the ball. Beckham kicks it out, but he ends up falling over and seems like he's fine. Then all of a sudden the stretcher's on for him. Yeah, but then all of a sudden he's back on. He's back on. Don't worry about it. It was just, I think it's very cautious use of stretcher there. Yeah. Like we're taking no chances today. It, it was interesting when he's on the stretcher. He's actually sat up on the stretcher, which I've never seen before. Usually it's like, right, you've got to lie down to, yeah. for us to take you up. It's just like, oh, just carry me over there, will you, so I can come back on. Like yeah. He just doesn't want to exert any more energy than he has to. A little bit of Ronaldinho in 26 minutes. He does really well to, to break and take on Ashley Cole, find some space on his own in the penalty area, but he just can't find the clean shot. It feels like out of the big three R's, he might actually be the one who who's who's shining brightest at the moment. I know, I know, you know, they're not exactly firing on all cylinders, but low key, Rivaldo and Ronaldo are the ones we all know mm. at this point, and um, he's kind of doing his magic uh, under a bit less scrutiny. I think so, definitely. They've not really been in the game so far, like a couple of touches, but nothing, you know, to the level they were at the tournament as well. You know, both top scorers, both you know, being the big influential players for Brazil. Yeah. Um, well, obviously, Beckham's back and his influence is massive. He's, he's in kind of superhero mode after that. I think he's quite angry at the foul. Yeah. Um, he tries a shot from about 35 yards that's blocked. It bounces back to him and he plays a bit of a chip into the area, which is cleared. And he shoots again, which is blocked. And then he shoots again. <laughs> He just wants to lever that ball into the top corner. He does. Like you say, it's kind of superhero mode for David Beckham now. But England are finding themselves, you know, they're forcing themselves up the pitch through a series of fouls. It, it feels a bit cynical from Brazil, but it, never, it just feels like, well, I'm, we're bigger than you as well and we're more physical. So you are, you know, you are going to get fouled a lot more. But, you know, they're starting to string a few passes together and actually looking, wow, we're ahead. We've got to make the most of this maybe. Yeah, uh, you mentioned the fouls. Just no spoilers for the rest of the game. But overall, um, I think Brazil are quite dirty in this game. They're quite cynical throughout. Yeah, I think there's a. I think I think it's them with it that um, there's a book being written about them and South American football. You know, angels with dirty faces. I think it's called. Oh, okay. And uh, you do see, you know, it's you know, stereotypical of South American sides to be oh, quite dirty, and it's it's a bit route one to be saying that, but. I think there's a point later when like the foul check comes up in the bottom of the screen and, and Brazil are way ahead on that. And you do see England winning you know, free kicks in and around the area and not quite doing anything with them at this point. Kind of smart in the heat, really, yeah. to just frustrate the other team. Well, yeah, yeah. Hot and bothered. Well, exactly. I mean, talk about hot and bothered. England fans are thinking, we're not going home. It's They're like, not bothered, are they? Calm down. <laughs> it's like not even near half. Well, it's about half, getting close to half time, but it's just like, can't be singing that this early, surely. Did you spot a Wolves flag in this game? Because there's a lot of England presence. I saw none eaten. Oh, okay. Not not close enough to be of note, but I, I don't think I saw one. If no. anyone watches this game or finds a copy to watch, let us know if you spot an England flag and send us a pixelated screenshot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't spot a Wolves flag in this. There's not, like I say, there's a couple of flags, but it's more just like shots of England fans all holding up. Like, remember through the anthems, there's like, they're holding up a little St. George's Cross, I think, some of the people. On, on 30 minutes, there's a uh, deep uh, deep ball from Danny Mills headed over by Heskey. Um, I've got to say, I've, I'm I'm really impressed with Heskey's first 30 minutes. He's obviously a figure of ridicule in some sense for his England career. Mm -hmm. Hasn't got the best goal record. Um, but I really see what he's bringing to the team in this game. I think so, yeah. He's being that physical player who is, you know, winning fouls and, and you know trying to get England up the pitch but it feels a bit awkward at times because Heskey and Owen are playing so far apart at times like Heskey has been dropping back but even when they're playing up front in the same line they're so far apart it feels like they're actually playing on their own both of them yeah it's it, it odd sometimes there's a little bit of a break on but you think there's so much ground to make like you're either going to try a pass that's going to get snuffed out or Heskey's going to have to bring it forward and he'll get all the players will catch up with him. I think there's no, there's not really any dribblers in this England team as well. I think Michael Owen's pace had kind of deserted him, like for that lightning pace at the start of his career that we saw in France not yet. Yeah. But you look at the rest of the side, there's it's a lot of, I don't want to say plodders, but it's 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 not too dissimilar to that. Is there's no one who's going to go right? I'm going to carry the ball forward. Yeah, uh, Brazil, um, for, for, you know, for their part in this game, they're kind of mainly resorting to kind of long range speculative shots. Um, Great. Yeah. Great for England. I mean, come on. Bloody hell, 37 minutes in, that, that's when I made their observation. So Just easy at this point. Yeah, yeah, easy. 
Um, th- then they nearly break twice in a minute. Some lovely flips and tricks from Ronaldinho, followed by a uh, deflected ball through that nearly breaks for Ronaldo. Um, and then we get another stretcher. Yeah, second appearance, isn't it, for this time Heskey? Yeah, Heskey. I was just saying how good he was playing. I mean, you've got to go some to, to, to get Heskey on a stretcher. He's, he's a physical presence up front. Yeah, definitely. I think you made a note that you were quite impressed with him, Beckham and Cole at this point. Yeah, Cole's got such a hard job. Um, yeah. Beckham has probably been better than in the other game we've seen him. Um, the Argentina um, friendly, mm. really quite... Uh, I don't know how to describe him. Erratic. Again. Erratic, yeah, yeah. He's quite erratic in this, actually, but at least he's sticking to the right of the uh, right of the park. And, for now, yeah. And he seems to be re- really enjoying his leadership role. Like, you oh. he, he can see this game means a lot to him. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, this would have been the furthest he's got um, in, a, in a tournament with England as well. And, you know, with that way everything that happened at France 98, you feel that he really, in many, every way, was kind of carrying the baton for England. And I know we were just talking about Brazil and their long shots. So that's great. But I just felt they keep having more of them and they keep getting close to that little bobble or that yeah. little bit of luck where, where it was, as we've said a few, for three times now, mm. you make your own luck. And um, they keep having these shots and, and it's just, they're knocking on the door a little bit when we've got, say, five minutes left of the half. I think they're knocking on the door without make, you know, making anything you know massive. Maybe they're panicking slightly because you do think, well, if I, if I keep shooting, I'm, something's going to happen and it'll fall to, fall to you know, Ronaldo. You know, it's a player you don't want the ball falling to for England. It's him because he will just finish it. You know it's going to happen. Uh, we, we have just a couple of minutes. Well, we have three minutes added on for England to hold on and record what would probably be one of the best ever halves of football in a World Cup for England. Yeah, in terms of a result, in definitely. In terms of a result, yeah. Taking who, what are seen as probably the favourites at this point, Brazil, after, you know, Argentina uh, and France have both gone out. True, and, and and they're on fire in the group stage. Goals coming from everywhere. Yeah. So we've got three minutes added on all those because of all those bloody injuries to our brave boys. <laughs> um, Cafu goes in hard on Ashley Cole as England attempt to break. Uh, Cafu, we haven't really mentioned him, but he's been great in this first half in his own way. Uh, the resulting free kick nearly opens the door. Uh, for England, but the keeper clears with his feet. So we're, you know, we're not we're not out of this yet. We're we're dealing with Brazil well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, whenever Brazil have the ball in England's defensive third, they look to like, you know run through England. It's kind of the opposite of what England are doing. Really, it's always Ronaldo, Rivaldo, Ronaldo, you know, Ronaldinho running through towards England, and, and you know the midfield and defence are just doing enough at the minute. And you know, three minutes into added time, as you know, it's, it's petering out. Really, nothing's really happening as the ball's in Brazil's half. <laughs> Here's Ronaldinho with Rivaldo making a run down the centre and Ronaldo to his left. It's Ronaldinho. Oh, it's Rivaldo for Brazil. He's equalised. It's 1-1. And it's Rivaldo. The goal came in the 47th minute. And Brazil are level. And the R's there. England apart Ronaldinho with the run he had two options he found Rivaldo and that precise left foot finish Trevor means it'll be one all at half time yeah you've got to trace it back just in, into the, near the centre circle Paul Scholes had a chance to make a tackle he, he didn't want to because he thought he might concede a free kick he backed out of it and suddenly Ronaldinho went he had two little step overs it's a delightful weighted pass to Rivaldo then he just picked his spot and what a time to get an equaliser, goodness me. Oh. We had to dream, didn't we? We just oh. had to dream, just couldn't make Who's it. Who's saying we're not going home? <laughs> That's like out. Out. All, all of you out. You knew what you were doing. <laughs> Tempting fate. And this is quite a famous goal in itself. Um, is it? A lot to dissect in that part, isn't it? Yeah, there's a lot to dissect. So uh, England, England are attacking. Um, they're they're pushing forward. There's a there's a great uh, tackle by Carlos who slides in, um, and and well, as he slides, David Beckham kind of jumps over the, over the challenge. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, Roque Junior sweeps it forward. Um, it, it runs for Scholes. He's about to win it back for England, but uh, Cleberson slides in again, and Ronaldinho runs into the space that uh, in, into the space to connect from the uh, the slide. Suddenly, England are facing the the three R's uh, running at them. Only three players behind the ball. Ronaldinho does a lovely shimmy past Ashley Cole and has Ronaldo to his left and Rivaldo to his right. He plays the ball perfectly into Rivaldo's path, who opens up his body and slots into the far corner. Uh, this this um. This goal is very famous for David Beckham shirking that challenge, so to speak. Mm. What's your take? 
yeah, I think there's a there's clearly the problem has come when David Beckham jumps over the challenge. I mean, when you when you watch it in real time, it doesn't look like oh well, you know, he's he's jumped out of it because he's a coward. I think he's trying to jump out of it just so he doesn't get injured because it's it's going out. It's clearly going out, and he doesn't. I don't think he really sees Carlos coming behind him to sweep up, and then you've got Rocco Junior straight away. It, again, it's almost like that Nike advert where you, where you do see them kind of on the floor sliding it to each other like it's like cage football almost, which is what they're doing. Very true. I never thought of it like that. Yeah, Beckham's not shirking a challenge. He's not one to shirk a challenge. Like, he, he never really did that. I think, know? I think the, the well, there's a couple of problems, but with the Beckham thing, I think because he, like you say, he so wanted to be on the pitch and he's so close to half time at this point, he's just thinking, right, just, you know, we're so far up the pitch here. Yeah. He has lost possession, but would it have been any different if Beckham would have just kicked the ball against Carlos and they'd have gone up the pitch this way? I think the problem comes because England have got so many players committed forward. I mean, in the still we've got here, you can almost see Danny Mills in the background and mm -hmm. he's really high up and you think, it's a minute to go here. Just don't put these play, don't go forward like that. Skulls gets obviously dispossessed as well. Yeah, that's that. But it's in a similar way. So it yeah. looks like he's going to take the ball. Cleberson kind of clips it away from him. And all of a sudden, it's again, that's like hockey almost, like taking it off him. Ronaldinho's in and Ronaldinho is just sprinting at England. And I think he did so well. I think Ashley Cole as well. I mean, you get what a defender he was. I think at this point, he just sees that shit, we're in trouble here. What's going to happen? And he kind of doesn't do anything. Ronaldinho does give him a little shimmy and he goes over and you just think today, without a doubt, someone would have brought him down. Yeah. Just taking the yellow card, just smash into him, do something. And they just can't get it because they've got too many players forward and they've just gone for it too early. God, it hurts. It yeah. really does because that was such a good half for England and, and the, they had the lead. Yeah. Even if it was nil-nil, you'd go, that was a good half for England. Well, I think as well, you know, I've seen that when, when Beckham jumps over that challenge, it's one minute 35 of the injury time is, is gone. So you can, you think a minute and a half, that's all you've got to hang on to. But 20 seconds later, the ball's in the net. You think if, if our players hadn't been chopped down for it, you know, three of them needing treatment, we wouldn't needed three minutes of added time and the, some might have already gone. But just, ifs, yeah. buts and all of that stuff and yeah. we're at half time and we're drawing. Yeah, uh, neither team's played well, really, at this point. You know, only one chance for each, and they've both taken them. And England, again, will be just furious of how that has ended at that point. So people have had the point, they've had the sausage at half time, and uh, it's time for the second half. <laughs> that, that famous Japanese sausage in the ground, or is this at home? <laughs> this is the boys back home. Yeah. Oh, okay, they've had the breakfast now at half time. I, I think I'd have, I'd have, yeah, I'd have gone into a different classroom by this point. Yeah. What, 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 do you remember where you were? I was going to say, yeah, school? yeah. So um, I wasn't at in school. Um, I was on a school trip to, oh, okay. to Disneyland Paris. Oh, really? And I'll bring us right up to date because we, um, you remember you could used to get like text updates. Yeah, yeah. So there was, we couldn't have it on the radio on the coach because we were going from our hotel to Disneyland um, Paris. And as we got there, um, my, our PE teacher his name was Mr. Games. Mr. Games. A great, a great name for a PE teacher. <laughs> Not into sport. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't choose the games life. The games life chose me. <laughs> um, he announces, because he gets the halftime update, one, uh, no? Well, it would have been 1-1, one, one, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, he must have got a goal one then, because it was positive. Yeah. I remember like... I think you could like subscribe to like a text service, then you get a text whenever the team you requested would score, wouldn't you? So I remember when we arrived, that's when the, the goal update came through, and everyone's going, Whoa! on this coach and, and i remember um our teachers saying to us now when you get off there's going to be people trying to sell you stuff and what have you you're not to talk to any of them and stuff like that and we're all buzzing coming off the coach and this guy goes you guys english and then we were like <laughs> i was like yeah and he went david beckham del boy and i was like yeah and then we're like jordan no I told you not to talk to these your, people. Your two favourite things he could have said, Del Boy and David Beckham. <laughs> David Beckham, Del Boy. <laughs> and yeah, I got in a bit of trouble. Everyone laughed at me, but um, that's where I was at, at half time anyway. <laughs> so the second half, while I went off to explore and, and go on those rides at uh, Disneyland Paris. <laughs> um, slow start? Yeah, another slow start. Uh, Brazil, you know, Win a free kick far out, you know, try and take it quickly actually, but the referee brings them back and it's, you know, it's miles out. It looks like it's going to be an in swinger, to, uh, to, you know, to the forwards in the Brazil penalty area. And they're taking up the far post position, those two. Oh, and Seaman's been beaten. It's a goal. It's Ronaldinho. He scored direct from the free kick. 
Ronaldinho has made it 2-1 Brazil. And everybody was watching those in the penalty area. Maybe Seaman was as well. The ball went over his head. Well, what a blow. And he, he starts to come. I'm not sure Ronaldinho is directly shooting, but look, he's having to back till he actually gets nowhere near. It just clips the underside of the crossbites. One of the softest of goals. But once it's halfway there, David Seaman started to come out anticipating the cross, tries to backpedal and, and gets nowhere near, then retrieving the situation. What a start now to the second half. No. No. <laughs> no in swinger, baby. No quiet start to the half. I mean... It's the moment everyone remembers from the game, isn't it? This is, you know, and, and almost from a lot of England's tournament. When I think of the tournament, I think of this moment, really. When you think of England, you think of this moment. This is one yeah. of the most famous England moments ever. Yeah. So um, to, to people who don't know, um, 35, 40 yards out, on far on the right of um, as Brazil are going forward, they've got a free kick. Ronaldinho lifts the ball into the area, floating, you know, floating the ball. It's like a golf chip almost, yeah, the way yeah, it, it, go, it goes up and down and right into the one place David Seaman can't reach it in the England goal, like his top right corner. He he is slow to go get back, but to me, it is just a unique and freak goal. I just can't think of many others ever like it. It's absolutely stunning. Uh, Motson's, Motson's, you know, in disbelief, um, <laughs> as, 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 as we just heard there. Um, but let's get to the real the real question. Did he mean it? Even all, all these years later, it, I think what you'd say is if it wasn't Ronaldinho, you'd say it's definitely a cross that's just found its way in there. But because of his ability and genius, you'd back him to try it. I mean, I haven't watched that goal for years. Yeah. And when I watched the game yesterday, there's not a not a, even a point. 1% chance in my mind that it's an accident. Like, could you imagine the XG on that now? Like how <laughs> ridiculous that XG is. But I, I, th he, I think it means He 100% means it. It's a perfect shot. It's absolutely amazing. Mm. David Seaman is just about enough off his line. It is a chance. He's left that gap open. And you can... It's, it's really unique, as you say, but um, yeah, no, I'm not having it. I'm not having anyone say that that's not meant to be a goal. No, I, I think it absolutely is, but... Like you said, there is just an absolute shock amongst everyone that's watching. Like you said, John Motson, he can't believe it. It's the way he leaves the poise. He goes, I mean, Seaman's been beaten. Yeah. Like, like he just can't quite believe what's happening in front of him. And, you know, the delay to is so fitting. I mean, he, like we said, as you heard, everyone was watching the people in the penalty area. Maybe a Seaman was too. The ball went over his head. Yeah, like he says yeah. it like that, like it's like he's almost like trying a race to, car driver, like to, shouting. He's trying to piece it together, isn't he? Like what have I just seen? But yeah. what England have just seen is a, a a horrible turnaround for them from having a, a minute and a half left of injury time in the first half to being three minutes into the second half and being two one down. A space of five minutes either side of half time. England have gone from absolutely cruising in a World Cup to shit. What are we going to do now? Yeah, and that's that's it. You can see on the faces what the hell are we going to do now? Um, for all the best will in the world, I don't think this team have a comeback uh, in them against this Brazil team. We, we've got a goal, fair enough. Mm. Uh, we haven't looked like creating many more, and and that is a confidence blow. I mean, but the worst, like the the, the timing of the first goal and mm. the nature of the second goal and the close proximity of them either side of half time is an absolute kick in the dick. I know, and I don't think England have either had had chance to write anything that's happened in the game because. The first half's ended, so you can't do anything. You've oh. come out and immediately, okay, they've got a free kick two minutes in. We've barely even touched the ball yet. So it's not even like they've gone, right, just play a, a couple of passes. Just take it easy. Let's try and get back into the game. They've not been allowed to do that on either occasion yet. Yeah, and and, and they're going for a bit desperate. They, they have a penalty shake just a minute later. Cafu brings Owen down in the box. Uh, doesn't, doesn't really look no. like it should be a penalty. There's a half a chance... Um, for Heskey, not long after that. Yeah, he makes some space, slams the ball across the area and Ed Milson puts it behind for a corner and that's the first time you really hear the England fans since the since the first goal really just go, come on, right, let's get back into this. Yeah, yeah. Heskey again, really good, really good. Probably England's um, best player maybe in this yeah. game. Yeah, probably. I don't think there's a great deal to pick from at this minute, but I guess a lot of the players were kind of verging on sixes and sevens and then yeah. when the two goals go in, you're like, oh, actually everyone's probably been a five. Yeah, where's Nick, what, what has Nicky brought? been up to yeah what, why is he in, well, look at Pele now what are you doing I mean <laughs> England do make their first change here Trevor Sinclair comes off and Kieran Dyer comes on I mean Kieran Dyer had been brilliant form for Newcastle in this in this period and a really exciting player 
Yeah, I'm also surprised to see Kieran Dyer come on, but yeah, God, we needed changes there, and um, he look he looks quick when he's on. You know, he looks like he's got a lot more pace than even the, the you know he likes of Michael Owen and what have you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he's probably one of the few players who is a ball carrier in that England side. I think I don't think England really ever knew where to play him. I think I think Newcastle kind of played him on the left because they had Solana on the right, or or maybe even through the middle of the pitch, rotating with Bellamy at times. Yeah. Um, well. Okay, let's yeah. let's trudge on forward yeah. then, because there is a big moment in the game right again. Yeah, and um, let's let's have a listen to what happens. Ronaldo's just inside him. Ronaldinho is coming across now. Try to release Roberto Carlos on the left. Mills for himself in. Oh, there's a card, and I think it may be red. That is a real harsh card. I think yellow might have been enough there. It's a bit like Totti, really. You'll never know how it might influence the game. So, yeah, so England lose the ball and Rivaldo plays it to Ronaldinho outside the area, um, facing away from goal. Mills closes him down and the ball's just loose around the both of them. Mills and Ronaldinho both go in for the challenge and Ronaldinho goes over the ball and plants his studs kind of onto Mills' ankles. I mean... It's given straight away as a red card. Immediately, the referee immediately runs over, gives Ronaldinho a red card. And he's, again, he's just smiling, looking at it, going... Me? Really? You're doing yeah. this? Yeah. Really? I, I don't think a lot of the players really know what's happened at first because they go, all right, it's like he's quickly come over and get, to give a yellow. To do a red so quickly at that point. Yeah, there's a lot of shock on the faces, but uh, Brazil just kind of get on with it. I mean, the, the, probably the star man in this game has been Ronaldinho mm. and, and definitely with that incredible goal. Not call it a fluke there. He scored an incredible goal. Agreed, yeah. Yeah. And um, you see uh, Scolari on the bench giving instructions to the players. He wants to um, basically use Rivaldo and Ronaldo as a front two and the rest get a bit more solid. Yeah. And, and they've, they've also kind of got that extra man in defence who's moving into midfield a bit as well. So in reality, defensive wise, they've not lost not anything. Is, yeah, not much has changed for them. And Rivaldo was just taking instruction and, and he just looks like, yep. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Understood, boss. Thanks for the tip. You yeah, know. thanks. Thought that already, but we'll uh, we'll trudge on. But um, <laughs> good to know we're on the same wavelength. <laughs> oh, I was going to do that. Yeah, <laughs> I I do not think that's a red card. Um, I'll be honest with you. Um, I found I couldn't really make it out on the mm. visually on the on, on the replays and what have you. Yeah, to see because it would be one. It, it, it's borderline. It's like mm. one where you'd watch the VAR break it down quite a lot these days. Yeah, they'd probably pause Ronaldinho's studs on Mills's ankle, but to me, I don't feel like there's. I don't feel there's enough danger in him going over the ball to do that. But yeah. also, his studs are showing. But what's he supposed to do with going into that tackle? Like if if he goes inside footed, he could break his foot basically. Yeah, I, I, about an error in now, and um, Brazil are two one up, but down to ten men. So. It still just looks like England... I mean, Beckham throws himself on the floor uh, to try and win a penalty mm. uh, from a Chandra Carlos. The referee isn't having any of it. Plays on. It, it feels to me like they know they're going to need a cheeky penalty or something, like a little cheap injection of, yeah. of, of belief because it's been drained from them. Something outside of outside of their ability to do something. I mean, there's, there's a kind of the phrase of football just kind of happens around certain teams. It just feels like football's happened to England at this point, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and then the take off Ronaldo. I mean, Christ. Yeah, just the uh, the luxury to do that because he's not going to run around. I think Rivaldo would do, but they were like, right, if we're going to go through, we're going to need Ronaldo in the next round. And we've got Rivaldo up front already. So Edilson comes on. I hadn't really heard of him much, but he looks like he's you know, a bit of a work hard, you know, quick forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A bit, bit of a work hard. D does the uh, doggies, as they yeah, say, yeah. does all the running for Rivaldo. I mean, this is the first game in the tournament that Ronaldo doesn't score in as well, which just says everything about, you know, the, the, the tournament that he'd had up to this point too. I'm not sure if there's another opportunity for us to ever see Ronaldo again. No, pod? no, I don't think so. Yeah, in England, I don't think England have played a competitive game against Brazil since this one. Yeah, well, uh, he, there's so many great players, but uh, yeah, see you later, Ronaldo. I know, yeah. How little we knew you. Didn't score, rubbish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we on a boat. You, you can take all your little goals and you can throw them in the bloody bin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we, we've got time. We've got time to get a goal back, mm. but uh, it doesn't look like it's, it's going to happen. No, I mean... You can't quite tell what England are doing, what their plan is. So when they commit men forward, they're really open at the back. And then when they do get the ball forward, the, the players are too slow to join them. I mean, poor Scholes had a really poor game for England. And, and yeah, he isn't able to kind of keep the ball in the way he has for his club or find other people because that 
midfield four and the back four have just been so far away from England's uh, strikers. They just can't, they're not used to passing it to each other at this point in the game without someone to carry the ball. I mean, you say midfield four, I mean, Button's calls have been absolute passengers in this game. Yeah, you can't even say, oh, well, you know, they've, they've not done much with the ball. It just feels like they haven't had the ball. Like, I, I couldn't even tell you who has as many touches for England in this game. Maybe Ashley Cole or Danny Mills, because they, they're slightly coming forward with it, but England just don't do anything with it. They're immediately, they're looking up and looking for a forward pass too quickly. Yeah, and Rivaldo has his bit of influence even after his uh, goal. Um, just a bit of wind up merchant yeah, stuff, I a mean, bit of time wasting. I mean, it's nowhere near as you know bad as what happened with the um, the Turkey game. The, the Turkey game, no, but he, he you know he goes up for a header and Campbell, you know, Cam, Campbell's fingers kind of go close to his face and he's down clutching his eyes. It reminds me a bit of um, do you remember when Son did that a couple of uh, maybe last year for for Spurs against would have been McTominay, I think, of Man United. He kind of like puts a hand near the eye and he goes down and they, yeah. and they give it and they give a foul for it it's really similar to that it's one of those isn't it where you're playing on and the player stays down mm. and you're like i know you're diving but I you're know. making me risk that you might be dead or something underneath I, there and you're just happy for us to take you know to have that and it's also worse when it's your team and their players down and they're you need to defend and you're like well it's not in the rules you've got to get up and carry on it's so annoying when you see players do that and yeah um, it's, it's a perfect tactic for knockout football. Yeah. Slow that game down, take all the steam out of it, win yourself a free kick, wind the opposition up. Mm. Uh, it takes a special breed to do it. I don't think England would ever do it, but Rivaldo <laughs> seems to love it at this point. Oh, it's def- his absolute fave. Definitely. I mean, I mean, again, you are looking at absolute micro moments for England at this point. You know, Mills has, somehow has the ball in the area, turns, and it's, it's deflected for a corner, and that's kind of as much as you can get. I mean, England had scored twice from corners at this tournament but they can't even seem to find their own their own players and shortly afterwards Paul Scholes is booked for a tackle on Rivaldo and, and again going back and looking at it I don't even think it's a foul but England fans amazingly are straight on the referee yeah calling him all sorts of names it's like yeah you, know, you won't have seen it but have you not seen the red card we're uh we've got 15 minutes to go um what to even say uh Doris <laughs> yeah. Purcell comes on for Michael Owen yeah um yeah, it's, it's strange one yeah I mean Brazil have got three tall centre halves, and uh, we just eating up every single cross. And you know, only Heskey, who's a tall player, on at that point. Vassell comes on for Owen, which seems very like for like. And as we mentioned, Owen's cool finish. You go well, maybe you keep him on if you get a half chance. He's going to take it. But You're not just going to risk taking Nicky Butt off and just losing that holding, or, or no. something, or something like that. Would take one of the defenders off. But it's it's quite strange because England they bring Vassell on, Michael Owen comes off, they play on England. I think the ball comes. Like out of play, and then Teddy Sheringham comes on for Ashley Cole. Like like, seconds later, yeah, literally seconds later, and it's like, why didn't you do them both at the same time? Like, was Sheringham just not ready? Yeah, and wasting wasting your own time, really, yeah. there, isn't he? Yeah, exactly. So we we made the changes, and nothing nothing is happening still. I mean, when you just kind of look at it out of context, it's a World Cup quarter final against Brazil for England, and there's a forward line of Emil Heskey, Teddy Sheringham, and Darius Vassell. <laughs> I mean, what kind of fever dream is this that we're living in? I might as well be playing up front for how strange that looks. God, I was and I was on a roller coaster completely oblivious, <laughs> thinking we've well, the last I heard, Michael Owen scored one nil, so I imagine two or three nil now. I imagine it's like you're on a roller coaster and it's like Mr. Bean, just not reacting, just dro- just going around on it, not interested, just like, Oh, I wonder what Owen's up to. Mine's elsewhere. Do they have any tellies at Disneyland? <laughs> I'm not sure. I remember watching the Denmark game because we were I think that was on a weekend as well, and we had like a school like a school business day or something you have to go somewhere like a water park and you have to like make a business for a day yeah and um i remember hearing it was two nil to england and then on the way back on the coach i think it was three nil england you know cruising the second half and someone had bought one of those little like camping tellies yeah and everyone was just trying to crowd around wow. them. and then when the game was like you know nothing was happening the telly was just getting passed around i'm like no one's watching it now <laughs> <laughs> well we'd, we'd you know we'd be watching this in the hope that we can do something i have a quick question obviously mm. we're missing um we're missing some creativity here um i think we both agree steven gerrard would have been so helpful to have had at this time yeah do you think the fact that england would never ever ever sub david beckham hindered him hindered the team sorry or do you think you still need him on in this because it just creates like Right wing, you could have brought Joel Cole on and mm. had something a little bit different, but you're never changing that right wing. So Roberto Carlos has nothing to worry about because he's seen what Beckham yeah. can do. Yeah, I mean, even moving Beckham into centre midfield like he'd done against uh, Greece, maybe he just didn't have that mobility or trust in his own 
properly to get around the pitch at this point because he, again he is recovering from that injury. He's played every game for England. I think he may have played in the warm ups. I can't quite remember, but it's a lot of football for someone who's clearly not fit. I don't think he has a great World Cup by any means, but he's he's still trying to push on. I mean, and when you don't have that fit, Steven Gerrard even coming off the bench, yeah, I mean that would have been something to really you know be hopeful of but it just doesn't happen and we don't really have the options there and, and five minutes to go Brazil are cruising they're just keeping the ball winning uh, little cheeky free kicks and mm. running the clock down you get four minutes of time added on um, listener are you expecting a lot to happen in those four minutes <laughs> the, the biggest thing of note I can see at this point again is that Kaká's on the bench yeah that's that's all I can de- uh, you know, glean from that I mean one last chance that England get a free kick in their own half Go to deliver the ball at the pitch. Oh, the whistle's gone. England are out of the World Cup. And Brazil, maintaining their unbeaten World Cup record against England, are through to the semi-final. It's all over. It's all over. As quickly, as quickly as we were delighted to be leading, we were behind and then... Nothing happened. Yeah, just we gen- covered the second half of this game in about ten minutes. I know that's definitely not what we usually do. <laughs> is it? We have to dissect every little thing, but there were no little things. I mean, again, Teddy Sheringham coming on was one of the most noteworthy things. Yeah, uh, England are out. England are out of the World Cup 2002, uh, and the, the, they didn't make a chance. They didn't really put up too much of a fight when they went two one down. I think mentally they were shot. The heat had affected the players more than you know Brazil who are from a hotter climate. And I think, you know, in the games that are gone, you know, they have got a good a draw with a good Sweden side. They'd beaten Argentina in a real backs against the wall, good performance, you know, knocked Denmark apart really. And maybe they thought, actually, we can do this. But when you're kind of staring down the barrel of a Brazil team who are kind of really finding their form, they go, wow, this is another level than what we've got out here at the minute. I mean, similar, well, not similar situation, but how bad England play in that second half, it's, Reminded me of the Iceland game from year 2016. You were just like, right, make something. Yeah. Make, do something. And that was against I- Iceland. Yeah, and exactly. I mean, in comparison, this Brazil side, when you perform that badly and you do not make a chance in the game really after the goal. They were probably just conserving energy. Or well, Ronaldo was. He was on the bench. Yeah, da- David Seaman was an absolute... He, he, t- he You can tell he saw all the newspaper headlines about, about him being mm. written. Um, I... I'm not saying I don't think he's at fault. Mm. It's just incredibly um, un- unlucky. Unfortunate, probably. Nobody else would have thought to have had a shot from there. And and he's probably been in that position literally probably about 10,000 times, mm. if not way more than that across yeah. his career, free kick from that exact position. And nobody's ever tried a shot from there because it makes sense to just cross it in. Yeah. But, um, and, and if they have tried a shot from there, they're not Ronaldinho and they aren't going to be able to, you know what, I'm going to try this. And maybe again, one in a thousand times you try that, you'll yeah. get near the goal or even just put in that proper sweet spot where David Simon can't get back. It's a one in a million goal. Yeah. Uh, England are out, Brazil march on. Um, well, we, we kind of know how they would fare in the World Cup. Uh, they, they face Turkey after this. Again, yeah, in the semi-final. Really tight game where Ronaldo scores to put them through to the final. Um, Brazil played Germany in the final. Uh, player of the tournament, Oliver Kahn. Uh, I think he was given player of the tournament at half time. I think it's in that weird era where he was like, oh, well, why not do this afterwards? No, just give it him now. At half time? I know. In the I final? I don't think they quite hand it to him, but I think they maybe announce it that he's... I think he made a couple of good saves in the game. He'd be incredible in the tournament. One of the great keeping performances as it went on for Jimmy to get there but he spills a shot from Rivaldo in, straight into the path of Ronaldo who you know writes the wrongs of four years previously puts Brazil ahead and soon after you know gets his second goal and completes what I think is genuinely one of the great footballing fairy tales with yeah. his comeback you can't be you can't help but be happy for Ronaldo and yeah. And, and yeah England lost to the World Cup winners well one of those things where you actually say you know if England can't win it, I'd want Brazil to win it. And yeah. this is this is one of my favourite teams ever when I think True. back. Uh, on the England side of things, uh, Sven, um, he, his, his position came under a bit of scrutiny, I think. Mm. Um, he said, I, I hoped we would have done a little bit better against 10 men. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. But maybe, you know, instead of a little of a lot better. <laughs> yeah, I hope we would have had a shot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, an article um, from The Guardian at the time, um, an opinion piece was um, was called When Plan A Fails, England Fail. Mm. That's very accurate and fair. 
Um, a famous quote about Sven from this game is attributed to um, Gareth Southgate, who said uh, at, at half time when um, you know England had just conceded and it was one one. Morale was a bit low. Um, apparently, Sven just let Steve McLaren do all the talking and hardly said anything. <laughs> um, it was very much just like, okay, well, we can keep trying and, and try this. Uh, he said, um, well, Safegate said, we needed Churchill in that moment, but we got Ian Duncan Smith. Mm. Okay, all politics aside, we can yeah. kind of get what he's, what he's yeah, aiming yeah. for there. Um, Rio Ferdinand would praise the Brazilian fullbacks. Yeah, um, yeah. He said they, you know, they went down to ten men and they played keep ball with us. And um, yeah, he just said he was so impressed by Carlos and Cafu. And it's one of those performances from them where they they're not outstanding as the game goes on, but as they go on, they're just so consistent. You go, God, you just, they're just wearing England down and pulling them apart. I mean, after the game as well, um, Ferdinand goes to he's one of the England players selected for the drugs test um, after, and he goes in to see. Uh, to the drugs area and Ronaldinho and Kaffa were both in there taking their tests too and and Ferdinand asked you know Ronaldinho did you mean it and Ronaldinho yeah. just kind of smiles and he said he did but Ferdinand's not convinced he's like no way he was lying Ericsson said he thought it was a lucky goal as well I think in the moment without the, the benefit of 20 years of hindsight and seeing yeah. the rest of Ronaldinho's career um, it's more than reasonable to think it's a lucky goal. I would have thought that at the time, but there's no doubt in my mind now that it isn't. Yeah. Uh, David Seaman, the villain, the villain. England always need a villain at this time. You know, a lot of scrutiny over his position, and he doesn't have. I mean, does he play once more for England? Yeah, as far as I'm, you know, as far as I can remember, I think he plays one qualifying game for the Euros against Macedonia, and he concedes direct from a corner as well. So it was kind of at this big ground swell of like, look, he can't. We can't keep doing this, and. I Let's think get David James in. I know. Need yeah. somebody solid. I mean, how many times has that come back? Oh, he's failed. Let's get David James in. You know, yeah, he's yeah. A capable keeper and all that kind of stuff we have to say. But in reality, it was still David James. So um, we've kind of covered all, all from the football side, but um, we didn't want to give any spoilers. So we saved a bit of um, f uh, nostalgic stories about where people were watching the game um, and, until the end. Nick, do you want to start with one from... from uh, your friend circle? Yeah, yeah. So one person said to me that they were, you know, watching the first half um, at home, eating their cocoa pops, and had to listen to the second half in on the way into school. They said they remembered, you know, Brazil playing in that odd blue kit, and they didn't think David Seaman was at fault for goal, the goal either. All these years later. Yeah, I remember me and all my friends being really sad in in um, Paris after yeah. after the game, <laughs> and and some guy in a Brazil top who was very. Um, animated shall we say mm. he was looking at us and doing like crying eyes as if to go oh you're sad are you and how old was this person he was about 40s 50s <laughs> he looked like someone who was like you know drunk all the time and does like magic tricks on the street yeah. and what have you yeah i know what you mean um i've got a um do, is there any more memories that you would like to share i've got i've got a kind of a a, a nice well-written one from, from oh. my friend cash okay i've got two quick ones um, i had another friend saying that they were on their coach on the way into school when owen scored and said everyone was jumping up and down on the motorway whilst one of the coach people at the front was just screaming for them to sit down <laughs> yes. i love to have seen like a coach just full of kids just going absolutely crazy on the motorway on the m6 like something <laughs> from carry on except with kids <laughs> Or like Jolly Boys Day Out or something. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I had one other person as well, um, my, my friend Adam Power, who said that he was doing his GCSE exam uh, during the game. And he said at the time on the back of his exam paper, he wrote down the England starting 11. Yeah, I've done that with like my FIFA teams at the time if I'm, if I'm finishing <laughs> an exam early or something. I think this was definitely, if I know Adam, this would have been before the exam. Oh. So this would have been like, right, so you can turn over now. And he was just going, Seaman, Mills. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the one so um, Cash, who uh, put together our fantastic logo, uh, shared his wonderfully written memories of the of the day. Yeah, um, I just I just thought this was really really nice, and I think it sums up a, 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 that day for a lot of people. It also gives us an answer to the question of was it hot at home um, mm. because it wasn't. I'll start. It was an overcast day back in two thousand and two. We got a school newsletter a few days before giving parents the option of letting people stay at home to watch the quarterfinal against Brazil and come in after for the rest of the school day or to watch it at school in the classroom. My mum took me to school. It started off like any other school day except our year was hosting the assembly of that day. The theme for the day? Brushing and flossing. <laughs> Surely pick something more related to the football. As the day went on and the kickoff became closer, and closer, a few of us got to get changed into our England shirt. Except Harry. He wore a Brazil shirt and still does to this day. Our class had to join the year above and we rolled into one classroom. 
As the TV was wheeled in and set up, the class was shouting for Owen, Heskey and Beckham as the players walked onto the pitch. Some of the girls in our class had created England flags with crowns and paper, waving them as kickoff was about to begin. Kickoff and the rest was history. Full time. <laughs> the TV was rolled back into the corner, England shirts were taken off and blue ju- school jumpers were put back on. The rest of the day we spent rehearsing our assembly. Not another word was spoken. I can imagine that. I mean, very well, you know, very well put together there. I must very say. Charles Dickensy. Yeah, I almost feel like we. Well, maybe we could do it in the edit. You know, giving you another job to do. Maybe we can put. It feels feels like one of those Steve Wright confessions, doesn't it? Oh, you, you, it feels like like you mean like a musical bed underneath. Yeah, it. just like really sad. You know, one of those things that happens. <laughs> nice little strings and stuff like that. I like that idea. <laughs> um, let's wrap it up quite quick because I got a train yeah. to catch. Yeah. Um, there's only one more question to ask. Was this England? I kind of don't think it is, actually. So England usually go out of tournaments in a more spectacular style than this. It's either a massive error or blame someone or, or, you know, it's late on or some kind of heartbreak. And they they had time to address this and they just let it to happen happen to them. And it's it's not really heartbreak. It's just kind of crushing disappointment, isn't it? It's just like, yeah, I I don't think it's very England, personally. Oh, I'm I'm kind of surprised at that because I think David Seaman is the the one uh, to blame. There's the, also a massive error there as well. The, there, is, there is an error in a villain, but I think it's just because it was the like it just took so long to happen. Yeah, um, I'm going to disagree, and I'm going to say this was very England. Okay, um, I think it's the hope. It's giving you that little bit of hope, and then snatching it away, and just weird circumstances, you know. Um, it, and it's yeah, it's it's that doing nothing, mm. like. I, although I suppose at some other tournaments you'd have had a disallowed Sol Campbell goal to to have made it truly chef's kiss. Yeah, that's peak England. M- more incidents apart from kind of just one big incident. I know there's the, the Valder goal and whatever, but there's kind of just one thing that happens and you're just like, oh, well, that's it. You, you're gone. Yeah. Uh, well, we disagree, but we can both agree on one thing. Um, bloody hell, that was that was annoying to watch even 20 yeah. years later. Very, very much so. It's one of the most frustrating games we've done, I think. Yeah. Um, not much else to say other than the the admin. Uh, yeah. You can find us on social media at isvis underscore England. We're on Instagram and Twitter mainly, and I think only, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, you can also email the show. Please do get in touch with game recommendations, um, any questions that you have, uh, any opinions that you might have. Uh, you can find us at isthisenglandpod at gmail.com. Um, I think that's it. Anything else from you, Nick? That's it from me, mate. Go and get your train. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>